Yeah, we put the map up there. I don't know if anyone has any questions now as far as what just what the boundaries may be. Kevin, you might want to you know put that uh, the map yeah. up again just in case people are not clear when we're talking about uh, you know changing, taking some of the I-5, putting in the IX, mm -hmm. and then taking some of the IX into the new watershed. So I, I would say just take a quick look at the map. If, you know, if the public has any specific questions or if they're looking at just a specific property and wanting to know where that may or may not fall. Yeah. And I think just something to keep in mind is when we were looking at this task of trying to balance the protection of water quality as well as permitted uses in certain zones in this area that could be, you know, really helpful to be so close to I-91. Something we, you know, previously mm -hmm. it was looking at modifying the existing IX zone with the same boundaries and the existing I-5 zone with the same boundaries. But that ended up when you restricted uses in, uh, say, the IX in order to protect the water quality, that ended up affecting all of this other land that really wasn't draining to the Mackenzie Reservoir, wasn't part of the uh, watershed protection overlay district. So in order to not create a burden on those other parcels, we wanted to separate these zones out, which is why we created this new watershed interchange district. So mm -hmm. I hope that kind of frames, your mind. I know it's a kind of, a, it's a big change, but it's really the best way that we could properly define uses and make sure that we're not unfairly restricting properties that aren't draining to the Mackenzie Reservoir. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. I'm Ron Latoro. I live on 1009 North Farms Road. Behind me is Walt Wabisky's farm. And on the side of me, I have his an old house sitting there, a barn, a silo. I want to know, someone try to tell me they're going to knock that all down and, and clear it out and just have vacant land. And I want to know what's going on behind me. Someone's trying to tell me from my border, boundary line in the back, they're going to go 300 feet back and start the project. That's bogus. Well, and sir, that, sir, if I, I don't mean to cut you off, but we're, we're not discussing, we're, we're looking at the regulations right now. Oh, well, but, let's. You know, I, I think that's where we want to focus on now. I think we want to stay kind of on track as far as you know, what we're... Uh, well, okay, that about. map you had up, I want to see where I am on that map. Oh, okay, well, sure. Could you put the map up, please? All right, where is North Farms Road? North Farms is right here. Oh, mm -hmm. right there, huh? Yes. And what's in white? White is RU40. And what's that going to be? A residential zone, no changes. No so changes. up there where it's pink or whatever color it is. The purple, that's that's the current IX zone, and it will say the IX zone. Yes. And when, when that's IX zone, what's that mean? What, what are they going to do with that zone? What are they going to put it in? It's IX well, I think zone. we're going to be getting to that, sir, because that's when the next thing we're going to be talking about is the IX zone. And we're going to be talking about what the, the approved uses are going to be. I, why don't we start with the, with the IX? Okay. So we're going to pull up the proposed zoning language for IX. So if anybody has questions or... Um, you know, comments, ways that we can better refine or define anything. We greatly appreciate that. So anything that's in red are the changes. Um, we just got rid of some of the extra language on the IX zone. Um, everything that's in black is what's existing in the IX zone currently. So these are the uses that are allowed with site plan approval. Um, so anything, like Kevin just said, anything in black. So before printing and publishing was allowed, it's still allowed with our proposed, our proposed regulations. So you can see that we're, you know, adding in warehouse and distribution general and warehousing and distribution limited. Which we defined, go back and discuss definitions if you like. Does anybody have questions on the uses? I have a procedural question. Sure. Um, Mr. Chairman, I'll be going the way the commissioners ask first and then publish. That's what it Yes, that's probably that, easier because you guys come up with the last more no, substance. That's, and that's what I'd like to do, as I mentioned just early on. Mm -hmm. You know, have to present this, and then we ask commission members for comments, and then we'll, you know, ask the public for comments. Mm -hmm. So, do any commissioners have questions or comments on the uses for the site plan approval, or do you want us to keep going Anybody? through? I'll, I'll ask the question, uh, <coughs> which I refrain from, from our last planning and zoning. We specified 
just warehousing. And took that as definition to include distribution and delivery centers. Why are we changing that now when we had a legal opinion that that fit under the warehouse definition? But we wanted to, uh, during the discussion, we wanted to define different warehouse definitions. Uh, we felt like it was the proposal uh, for the Amazon facility was a different uh, you know, type of use than the way a warehouse would be. And if I may, and really the, the stem of it all is when we were looking at WI, I was jumping ahead a little bit, but um, the general idea behind that zone is allowing uses with limited parking areas. So uses that wouldn't have expansive parking lots like what we do see with last mile delivery centers. So we wanted to make sure that was defined separately so we could specifically allow it in zone IX where it's appropriate and not allow it in zone WI. Does that make sense? Well, you, 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 you just threw in another definition, last mile delivery centers. You just start with the definition yeah, there. Yeah, like Call out parcel sorting of retail distribution. So a fulfillment center, parcel hub, or similar facility used for the storage, processing, distribution, or redistribution of parcels or products and delivery to retail consumers and other end users by means of vehicles with a gross weight not to exceed 26,000 pounds. So that would be a typical last mile uh, delivery uh, center. Yes. Yeah. Any other questions on the um, definitions? Yeah, I have the difference between and I, I think I'm just thick, but you know, manufacturing, manufacturing general and manufacturing alike. If you can just kind of give me the cliff notes as far as the major difference of those two. What? Uh, essentially, general manufacturing is more, uh, I guess, you know, more higher intensity of paper manufacturing, wood product manufacturing, plastics, rubber products, more. I would chemical based, you'd say? Yeah, so with light manufacturing, you wouldn't be producing any materials on site. You'd be taking parts that are already made and putting them together. So it wouldn't be. For, for general, you, you, you're saying you're taking, you have raw materials, yeah, raw you're, raw you're raw. doing, we're here, you're taking a light manufacturing and something that's already been processed to some degree, and then it's a component that you're, that you're adding to make something else. Is that correct? Exactly. Yeah, uh, Mr. Hine, we'll go to. Mr. Adams. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I do have a couple questions and comments, I think. Um, so if we scroll down to parcel, parcel sorting and retail distribution, um, that definition seems to be based upon um, a retail component. Um, but then when, if you scroll down to warehousing and distribution, both general and limited, it seems like the distinction that we're making is the parcel sorting and retail, the, with parcel sorting and retail distribution, the focus is on retail, whereas the warehousing and distribution, general and limited, is focused on wholesale distribution. Right. Okay. So I, I think in the titles of warehousing and distribution, mm -hmm. you should use the word wholesale, just like you did in the prior section, parcel sorting and retail distribution, whole, warehousing and wholesale distribution, general and limited. So that you have that in the title and it makes it clearer as mm -hmm. to what the focus is. Then on both of the, both the warehousing definitions, if you take a look at the beginning, just the first two words on each definition, you have a use for general, and then a facility for limited. Mm -hmm. That should be consistent, mm -hmm. either a use or mm -hmm. a facility on both. But That's inconsistent the way it is right now. Thank you. Um, the other question I had was with respect to warehousing and wholesale, the, the limited definition mm -hmm. for warehousing and distribution. Um, it seems like 
you know, I went through everything and it looks like the only differences between the two is that with the general definition, it includes freight and trucking terminals. Right. Um, and then the limited has to be in, indoors. Correct. Or enclosed. I mean, you know, with the limited definition, can't you, can't you just say something like, um, all, uh, all uses that would qualify as a warehousing and, and wholesale distribution general use, except for freight and trucking terminals that are conducted, um, or, or such uses must be conducted indoors or exclusively within an enclosed structure. Um, it seems it would just, I think, make it less redundant, make it less redundant and clearer. Right. Um, that's just my my thoughts on it. Um, and then my own my last comment um, is that with respect to the parcel sorting and retail distribution, you actually make reference to a gross weight. Yes. Yes. Um, do you want to do the same thing for warehousing and distribution definitions? Because it seems like what you're looking for is, is you don't want those small little bands. From, yeah. So like a minimum for a suite? Yeah. Yeah. Gotcha. yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Great comments. That it, Jamie? That's it. Thank you, Mr. I think Mr. Adams, did you have a question or two? Um, yeah, it was actually, Mr. Hine kind of covered the majority of them. It was uh, the general and limited warehousing. Um, it's just, there's a lot of overlap and, and overlay where I think it can get confusing when you start separating, you know, one district allowing general for a site plan mm -hmm. and limited for a site plan, another district saying we're only going to allow limited for a site plan and the, in general would be special permit, right. that it, it gets kind of confusing as to what type of a business would be allowed. And I, I just think that we would want any developer or, or any company that would be looking at a, at a parcel to be able to look at the regs and know right off the bat. So it's just, it's just a little bit confusing, a little bit wordy as far as whether it would apply. Um, and I think with a lot of Mr. Hines' suggestions, it might clean it up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But um, I'd like to see the language and maybe readdress re it to yeah, get absolutely. it in a clear and concise. But that's, that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Allison. OK, at this point in time, are there any uh, members of the public? Uh, we'll start with this gentleman, and then we'll work our way back. Uh, Jim Wolf, member of the Economic Development Commission. Just to respond to the manufacturing, the light, and the general. That uh, classification with the state is strictly manufacturing. If we have somebody that doesn't make any parts, they just assemble a product here, they're still a manufacturer. The state will not distinguish between somebody that assembles and somebody that actually builds the parts. And that, that's why that was broken down like that. Thank you. I think this gentleman, yeah. uh, Bob Tomeo, 14 Marie Lane. Um, first, I think this is a great, you know, great step. I think putting these definitions out that you guys are doing, it's going to help uh, long term. But relative to the definitions, just to make this real, if we think about North Haven, the big Amazon 800,000 square foot facility that trucks come in, goods there trucks go out to one of those parcel sorting facilities, what would we call that in these definitions? Warehousing distribution general. Be, I, I believe it would be warehousing and distribution in general because it would be defined as a freight terminal. Right, it just, I think it's something we should be like a little certain of because they're not going away, right? Um, and then the other question I had was around, or two other real quick questions. Something that they call cross stocking, which is, you know, trucks come in, they're kind of stuffed as their product for less than 24 hours and kind of go out the other side. The truck goes to another truck. They're not banned. Usually they're not banned, so I'm not really sure. But that's something that I think we should 
figure out where that slots. I have no idea where it slots. Yeah, that would basically be the same. And I think that the suggestion of a minimum gross weight vehicle that would, would help a lot with that. that so that would, again, put it into the warehousing and distribution general. And then my, just that's helpful. And my last question was, we, we seem to be silent on self-storage or warehousing. Is that deliberate? Or, um, it, there were some previous drafts where stuff was starting to come in. I don't see it anymore. Right now, it's under. It's allowed under storage warehouses, so I don't know if we're going to be able to look at that as well. We'll make sure it has a home for sure. Yeah. yeah. I'm not sure I'm going to ask the question yet. Are we just going step by step in different sections now? Yeah, that's what, that's what we're going to do. Well, then I'll wait for the general part then. Okay, good. Uh, yes. Yes. Um, so I guess staying on the definitions, if I may just read real fast and ask questions later. Manufacturing general, uh, the manufacture of products from extracted or raw materials or recycled or secondary materials, including bulk storage and handling of such products and materials, includes operations such as agricultural processing, apparel manufacturing, photographic processing plants, leather and light product manufacturing, wood product manufacturing, paper manufacturing, chemical manufacturing, plastics and rubber products manufacturing, non-metallic mineral product manufacturing, primary metal manufacturing. Can I have an example, please, um, Mr. Pagini, of a primary metal manufacturing, fabricated metal product manufacturing, automotive and heavy equipment manufacturing? I'm looking for examples because, right. again, back, we are talking about the IX zone. If we can have um, a map up that was in the beginning, mm -hmm. it is abutting um, the North Farms and Tangled area. On one side, abutting mm -hmm. land trust. On the other, it abuts big residential neighborhoods. Again, here are 18, you show only 30 houses in Tangled. We have a huge Merida neighborhood behind us. Um, and on one side, there are light industrial uses as in, including parks and backs, for example. I just have a lot of difficulties picturing something as primary metal manufacturing from raw materials or recycled. Um, to me, I've been in steel business all my life. I picture blast furnace or EAF-based steel mill. They were low qualified. How is this different from new core? or old brick steel that we have in I-20 and I-40. How is that compatible with the neighborhood and with the light? How is it compatible with the whole IX zone? Because we know how it came to be. 25, 30 years ago, the town wanted to develop, to, looking for commercial opportunities, created IX zones. Um, the neighborhoods were already there before any IX, before any rezoning. And so the language of IX as it stands now is a very gentle language. It allows very limited uses. Um, allowing this heavy industry uses to me is not really clarification. It, mm -hmm. it looks like rezoning. It completely changes what can go in. And not only it is a dramatic uh, intensification of the industrial use, which, again, commissioners know better. I don't have a background in that area, but to me it's completely incompatible with the, both the language of the regulation as it stood before, with the neighborhood, with the practical uses that are already present. Not only this um, manufacture of products extracted or raw materials and primary metal manufacturing, and automotive manufacturing, not only this all gets allowed now, it's only it, it's allowed by right, not even special permit. This is extensive, dramatic increase and expansion of the possible uses in this zone. And I think uh, we're talking about definitions right now, but this is how I read it. And I guess my question for commissioners is it just my impression, or this is a major change? It's a dra drastic change to that zone as it stands. Mm -hmm. And appropriateness of all of those users should be looked into very, very seriously. 
I guess I thank just you. Had, yes, well, thank you very much. I guess I'd ask. Yeah. So staff, as far as they'd like to just address yeah. this to some degree, and certainly we can have further comments and further discussion on it. So I want to, you know, I want to point out that we're not looking tonight to finalize anything. Yeah. Uh, you know, what we're looking for right now is input from the public. Mm -hmm. I fully expect that we'll have at least one and probably another workshop on that. So certainly the issues that the public are raising, certainly we're, we're interested in hearing that and looking to look at that further. But I guess I'd ask our staff. If I may just add one sentence to um, the intensification of industrial use as proposed here will degrade the whole neighborhood. The impairment to the property. Yeah, I think, you've already, yeah I, I think you've already made that point, though. I, I don't mean to cut you okay. off, but no, sure. We're just we're just beginning. So currently, the um, IX zone does have allowed uses, and one of those uses is manufacturing. Um, so basically, the the definition before we're we're broadening it. We're not broadening. We're making it more specific. Yeah. Uh, so we're if somebody comes in with any of those uses that we list. Today, before you know any changes are made to the regs, they would be an allowed as of right use in zone IX. Right, right now, yeah, today. So now, when these go forward, if they go forward, then they would have to specifically point to one of the ones that we listed. If it's anything outside of that, it would then not be an allowed use. So today, it's really not changing it or making it worse mm -hmm. because any of those items that were listed, any of those uses that were listed, the specific types of manufacturing are currently allowed in zone IX. Right. What's the difference between IX and I-20 and I-40 then? What's the difference between the expansion, which is in the middle of the residential chamber, and the true industrial zones that fall under cash? Well, the true industrial zones, well, like bulk storage of petroleum, Things of that nature. I don't know off the top of my head all the uses in the I 40 and I 20, but I don't know if someone has a, an idea or a copy of the regs on them. Uh, you can certainly look in there. They're more like bulk storage uses, more uh, higher intensity industrial uses rather than manufacturing. But anyway, as of right now, those uses are allowed, so we wanted to define them out more specifically and take them out of the watershed interchange district. But that was a good point to bring up. I can understand. This is a question I should ask now. What I'm concerned about oh, yeah, even that uh, it's Ronnie Maturo, 1009 North Farms Road. <clears throat> the question is, I don't know if it's the time to ask for it, is if you're putting in driveways and buildings, you're going to have runoff water. We're, talk, sir, we're talking about that right now so well, that's not that's part of that yeah this would not be oh, okay so that, all right okay we'll fine, fine. Yes, this gentleman here. Oh. next time okay okay anyone else and i see no one raising their hand yes gentlemen post open 1038 north farms what was the zone before then what changed now for example when you have the ix what was the zone before wasn't that an ix already it's already IX. This is not changing. This area here is not changing whatsoever. It's just this area inside the watershed is changing. So none of this is changing at all from what it currently is, except for those proposed text changes and definitions like that. So none of the actual map is changing in that district. It's just we've taken all of this used to be IX. So that's why it says proposed zone IX, because all of this was IX here, and then this was I-5. But this area here is not changing at all. I kind of looked at this already. Um, like I said, we anything in black is what's already existing. Uh, so the only uses we added was we, you know, we take the definitions as, as we just spoke about, uh, warehousing use, use for general limited, um, and then manufacturing, general manufacturing light. We just wanted to break up the uses, because I believe right now manufacturing uh, is allowed just as a whole. So, and we've added vet veterinary facilities. Uh, this is the data center language that would be required under special permit, sorting and the parcel sorting and retail distribution facilities. Kevin, perhaps if you could just maybe get a high level 
for the for the data center because mm -hmm. uh, I'm assuming that, uh, most individuals may not have a you know a copy of this. So just kind of a high level on that. I could explain it if you want. Um, so any data center uh, that would be proposed. So this got space proposal that I know you're all probably here for uh, has to adhere to the town municipal host agreement, which I do not have on me, but that, that requires a certain amount of uh, setbacks and a noise study itself. But these would be uh, in addition to that agreement, and these are more for data centers that would be in the future, say, smaller scale data centers, not, uh, not the got space uh, proposal that was in front of the town council. Uh, so you'd have to submit a sound and vibration impact analysis, and this would have to contain uh, information concerning all activity, equipment, and machinery associated with the use, and that's also during construction of the proposal. Uh, any sound and vibration levels resulting from such activity, equipment, or machinery, as well as all measures, including but not limited to, the, limited to those of structural and or non-structural related nature, uh, necessary to mitigate noise and vibration, and to ensure that the noise to be emitted from the proposed development does not substantially raise the established baseline environmental noise level, uh, emit harmful sounds, uh, even infrasound, so sound that can make you sick, uh, even though you can't hear it necessarily, and uh, or create vibration levels to a degree that will adversely affect the neighboring properties. Um, and then if the commission determines that a peer review of the noise and vibration impact analysis and warranted, the applicant uh, will be required to pay the town for the cost of the peer review. Um, and it, so it has to establish an environmental baseline using ambient noise in existing conditions. So they have to go out there, they have to uh, submit to, I believe it's uh, two weeks of uh, testing to get an existing noise level. Um, and then seasonal scenarios and hours of the you shall also be considered during the analysis. Uh, and then B, it talks about screening up mechanical equipment. So in order to minimize visibility from the adjacent roads and properties, ground level and rooftop mechanical equipment shall be screened. Uh, the screening may be provided by a principal building. Uh, mechanical equipment not screened by a principal building shall be screened by a visually solid fence, screen wall, or parapet wall. Uh, or other visually solid screen that shall be constructed with materials compatible with those used in the exterior construction of the principal building. Um, notwithstanding the requirements of the section, mechanical equipment located in a manner found to have no adverse impact on adjacent roads and adjacent properties shall not be required to be screened as determined by the commission. Uh, so in addition to the requirements of section 6.14, which are the currently existing landscaping requirements, uh, in section 4.9 F3, uh, which was which was the so there's special requirements there uh, for landscaping for the required front yard. Uh, so any where any side rear yard, uh, we're changing this language slightly. We just made that. Uh, modification. We're going to change that to a uh, residential zoning district, not a non-industrial zoning district. Um, so the minimum side and rear yard setback shall be dictated by the sound of vibration impact analysis and shall in no case be less than 150 feet. Uh, shall include a 100 foot wide landscape or natural open space buffer with an earthen burn at least six feet in height and a gradient of steeper than three to one. Um, as you can see, and I just wanted to say that right now, the current setbacks in the IX for any other type of use is only 70 feet. Uh, so we're requiring a minimum of 150 feet for even smaller scale data centers. Um, so if, you know, if it's a large scale project, like the Godspace project has to be, uh, it's dictated by the town council agreement. So that's, I believe it's 350 feet from residential. Uh, so this would require so these requirements for the got space project would be less than the town council agreements and the town council agreement would apply to that project. Um, so evergreen or native trees must also be planted 10 linear feet outside the edge of the berm to provide extra screening to residential properties and all substations shall be screened with evergreen trees not to exceed 10 feet in height. Uh, that was recommended by the electric division just to ensure that the trees don't grow too big but they fall on the substations. 
Um, and have to have fencing that will be designed to withstand ice and wind loading. Um, and all substations must be located at a minimum of 400 feet from a residential property or a residential zone district. Regulations, and they um, have a restriction on research, manufacturing, et cetera. And they state the facility has to be at least 25,000 square feet. Um, I didn't see that in this. It was taken out. Um, yeah. And the manufacturing definition doesn't have the restriction in it. I was just curious why that was removed. Because I think because we broke it down specifically by use. We also did add a definition for research and development. Sorry, it's cross-referencing the definitions. I, know. I guess in the definitions, there's no building size requirement, mm -hmm. but yeah. the old regs had building size requirement. Um, I don't know why there was a size requirement yeah. initially, but I also don't know why we decided not to, and I would just be so kind I of think, curious. Um, yeah, if I, if I remember correctly, so these have been obviously, uh, you know, being worked out for quite some time, but um, it was basically why, why is there a minimum requirement? We couldn't answer it, so we got rid of it. Um, if commissioners or public feel strongly there should be a minimum size requirement, we're definitely open to adding it back in, but we didn't want to, you know, get rid of a use that could potentially be, be great in zone I Okay. If you don't know, I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> so I think it's just an I'm old okay holder, to be honest. Anyone else? Mr. Simmons. Um, I have a question on uh, page one. Mm -hmm. um, because we don't often talk about these, but could we take the opportunity since we're reviewing the regs to strike 4.9C1 um, helipads? Um, with the loss of Bristol Myers and the mm -hmm. loss of their helicopter, I don't think there's any approved helicopter pads in the IX. Sound is an issue, so I would, I would suggest okay. striking that. Um, we were thinking about striking it before, but we just left. Yep, this. strike it. And um, I just uh, hesitant to say on page two, under subsection five, data centers, five A. Mm -hmm. So the sound and vibration impact analysis is all of that is only for a data center. Correct. Okay. And. Is the peer review language strong enough that it mirrors and matches traffic? So we would, we, would, we would require them to submit it, and if we peer review it, they would pay in advance of any decision. Okay. We've actually, so the traffic peer review was not saying that the, the applicant had to pay before a decision was made, but now we're saying they have to pay upfront before it's reviewed by a peer reviewer. Yeah, so we right. made this mimic that. There's a new state statute that allows you uh, to okay. require payment for it. Right at the top of page three, <coughs> and for the life of me, I can't remember why it was an issue. Mm -hmm. It's the very first sentence, it's a continuation, where it talks about the uh, all substations mm -hmm. must be located within 400 feet from a residential property or residential zoning district. Because some there are some residential properties in the IS that are uh, still there and existing as kind of like half farm, half residential uses. So we kind of looked at what was existing already. Okay. For example, on Northbrook Road, yeah. there's several houses. So that's, that's what I'm thinking of. Yeah. Yes. All right. So if it, so with residential property, and I guess maybe are we clear? Mm -hmm. It's only a house, not a garage shed. It, it, it's the primary residence. Yeah, just I get what you're saying. Yeah, well, I, what I'm saying is not what's written. That's why I'm, I'm thinking because right. it, it says residential property. Yeah. Are we, you know, and I, I'm thinking back. That there was an issue where someone had a large amount of land, mm -hmm. but the house was farther on the property than the intended use. So I, I just I don't know if that's the best way to say that. Okay. And then, if I could, Mr. Chairman, sure. my last comment is number six quite frankly, should be the new number one when we get rid of helicopters. Because mm -hmm. this is all in the section of what is um, required with special permit. Mm -hmm. But that's the that's the big one. Very you know. elite. Yeah, 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 exactly. So six should be one, uh, in, in my opinion. If you can go back to the map, we can just take a look at the, the parcels that number six 
that you just suggested would, would apply to would basically be this parcel here because it has right. both here, this parcel here, this parcel here, and I believe possibly this one, which is mainly in the IX but has a small portion here. Uh, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Just to describe it. Any other commission members? Yeah, Mr. Arnold. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, just have a couple comments here. Um, in, in section C to B, we make changes. Um, we change, we swap um, addition out for expansion. Mm -hmm. And then if you look at subsection C of that same section, mm -hmm. in that first line there on the top of page two, we make a reference to addition again. Um, I think oh, if, if we're being yeah. consistent, that should be to be catch yeah. expansion. Yeah. Um, the, another question I had is when we get into accessory uses, um, we're adding ground-mounted solar panels and satellite dishes. Is there a reason why we're not permitting building-mounted solar panels or satellite dishes? I would think that that's something that we would want. Anyway, I, we, yeah. we've done it in the other, we've actually included this section mm -hmm. in yeah, the WI district, uh, we could just copy that section and put it into the sure. IX district. Only because specifically, uh, you know, we were asked by the water division not to include ground onto solar panels in the watershed. Right. Uh, I, so well, that I yeah, that I can understand. So you yeah, know, that's a good catch. You know, and then my last question to you is. You know, we always, and I know it's it's in every single zone and throughout the regulations about um, uh, uses generating 100 peak hours um, or more. And I'm, I'm wondering, are, are, has there been any move away from that, that type of standard in regulations? I mean, we, we just had the, and I think uh, Commissioner Fitzsimmons brought this up, um, and it's a good, it's a very good point. You know, we just had that Amazon application, and what what we noticed was that it really didn't matter what the the, the peak hour traffic being produced was, because they were producing traffic throughout the day. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, I, I sort of wonder whether if any towns are, um, have started to move away from that standard. Not that I've noticed, and not on the state level either, yeah. as far as I'm aware. Um, you know, yeah. we'll be first. <laughs> we, tr we tried to move, I don't know if you mentioned this, we tried to move any use that would potentially trip the uh, 100 peak hour vehicle trips into a special permit use. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Sure. Anyone else? I guess I just have, when I was looking here on page, you know, on page four, you have following uses permitted subject to uh, approval of uh, zoning permit, that's G. And then, you know, I flip down on page five and then section H, which I guess is a, is a new section, that's just a repeat. Yeah. So I think one of those, just one gets struck, struck out, is that correct? Definitely, yeah. All right. Thank you. And then just the last thing, just on the first page, when we talked about, you know, hotels, initially it was, you know, one, uh, 150, at least 150 rooms on five acres. The acreage has been now uh, taken out. Is that a specific reason for that? I think, again, we didn't really have anything it, to... There wasn't really a reason that. to justify that. that yeah. Not that we could see, so, you know. Okay. And I think we, had, we took out, you know, like a motel. Like, we couldn't think of a scenario where there would be a 150 room motel. Yeah, that's, yeah, and 
we kind of thought that we were really looking for more of the hotel and conference center scenario rather than a, a really large motel. That wasn't yeah. something that we were looking to include in the IX. Okay. Yes, the gentleman right here. Jim Wolf, Economic Development. Uh, the hill pads. We had two hill pads in, and I believe there's one that's still available as this flag moving on. So if you take that out, is that you're forcing them to eliminate that? Or is it in the IX? Are you saying in the IX is an active? FAA approved helipad? I believe there was two originally. Hmm. W.I. Clark? Clark? Yes. Oh, man. Yeah. They don't use it anymore. But I, they're not using it, but it's still there. It's still available. All right. All right. And so, so does he get grandfathered in? Yeah, just want to be able to expand. Okay. Yeah. They just want to be able to expand the helipad. No more helipads. They wouldn't be able to make two. Don't buy a helicopter. <laughs> you got a place to land it. What is the hell of course down the road? I know. <laughs> Any other uh, members? Does that answer your question, Mr. Wolf? Yes, I think it. Any other members of the public that would uh, have any questions on on this section? Yes, gentlemen. You talked about the like again, sir. Uh, oh, Mike Taylor, Bobarowski, sixty-two Tangle Road. Thank you. I hear you talking about emitting the sound. What about smell? When you manufacture something, you emit smell. Where well, is the balance of what's horrible and what's not? So we put it under special permit because the special permit requirements take into account smell, noise, uh, smoke, everything that uh, comes from that facility. Uh, so we figured, you know, under the special permit process, we was looking to everything that would be going on uh, because it's hard to, to know exactly what the land use is at this moment. Uh, we just did, I researched data centers in Virginia, uh, New Jersey, California, Arizona, Utah, and just tried to uh, kind of write the language uh, as far as what uh, I saw there as far as uh, their, their issues. So that's any. I have a question. I'm Donna Rotsky, and I live at 62 Tankwood Road. Um, is this, this whole idea of expansion with Amazon and whatever you're going to build, is it mostly down on North Strip area, down on that street? Because I, I notice where uh, Flexall and right off of Flexall, they're building a big warehouse right next to it. Is it going, is your expansion idea going that route? Well, or are you looking, we already have some businesses on North Farms Road. So well, I, I think what we're, I mean, what, Kevin, you can jump in here, yes. or Allison, yeah. but what we're looking to do is we're not, the, the IX zone is not being expanded. Mm -hmm. Neither is the old, we call it the I-5, which now is going to become the watershed uh, right. interchange. Yeah. interchange zone. So it's not a matter of expanding various zones. It's looking, I think, as, as Mr. Keeney mentioned initially, is, you know, to look at, uh, some uses that uh, are in the in the old I-5 zone <coughs> in the watershed, and in, in trying to uh, delineate better the zoning between properties that are in the watershed and then properties that are out of the watershed. But it's not creating new, let's call them industrial uh, or you know I-5 zones. It's just trying to redefine. And looking at looking to try to protect the watershed and the uses in the watershed, and, and to I won't say restrict, but I think they are restricting, you know, some of the uses in the watershed. Uh, but as far as you know, your, your comments with Amazon and all of that, I mean, this has nothing to do with Amazon. You know, with Amazon, uh, we don't know in the future what uses would be coming into any of these zones. Yeah, I'm uh, Ken Lloyd. I'm the uh, president of the Wallach Community Farmers Group. I'm staying on top of what you've got, I'm trying to keep up to date. So on this X, the IX zone, what you've got here, are all these things potential future uses in terms of what you put in each line item? Like, they don't, some of these things already exist, or do they not exist? Can you elaborate on that a little bit? Well, any of the uses in black currently 
are allowed uses as of right now. Right. So I can't tell you every use that exists in the IX right now, but it pretty much uh, covers most of the, well, how it's being used at this moment. Uh, we just try to expand and kind of delineate in case you know we get certain projects in the future. It's just expand the definitions on warehousing and distribution and manufacturing. Because there's so many different types now of different manufacturing uses. And like I said, we can look at specific uses if you would like to and take them out of the definitions. And you know, this, that's the whole reason for the workshops. None of this is set in stone. So uh, we could definitely look at every specific use in the definitions and look at how it would apply uh, to the district. So as I'm looking at the list, I'm trying to keep up with you guys. Um, how much of this, like for example, on the Ike zone, it's mixed use, correct? It's not technically mixed use. Not technically, yeah. but there are mixed uses there. You drive around, you see. It was just kind of an old orchard, so they kind of, you know, we want to keep agricultural farming and forestry in there as an allowed use, just to allow it. But technically, there, I don't know if there's any farm or commercial mixed use developments in there uh, as we speak. Um, that's an interesting point. I mean, it looks to me, I mean, for over 30 years, we've had this mixed use of. Um, is it potentially possible, maybe in the more general question area, the way, mm -hmm. to change the IXO in areas where there's nothing there and protect that area from future development? I mean, come on, you group, I'm not saying you created, you know, yeah. but somebody got together with a group of people and said, let's create an IX set. So the public's here, why can't we change all that if we want to and change it to an RL zone and an NFA zone, mm -hmm. which I define as farms and the RL zone as rural areas that are not developed, which is not even in any of this. All this seems to be encouraging more development and that's what it looks like on the map. I mean, so I honestly, that's what it looks like. I'm just saying, that's, it looks like that's why we're here, to let you know that we're glad to be here, we're glad you're doing the workshop, because you don't know what we're thinking. And yet, there's a lot of great minds that this guy, I'm sure you work really hard at it, but as we get into more general questions, I think you have to look at what we want in the community. And there's over 40,000 people in this community that are not here, but some of us do represent a lot of people that are concerned. So I do understand where you're coming from, and my, I guess my response to that is that there's really two bodies that have any say as to what happens on a private piece of property. One is the Planning and Zoning Commission, right. as they apply the zoning regulations, mm -hmm. and the other is the property owner. Of course. You know, so if the property owner say that they own a farm, for right. instance, today, nobody's telling them they have to sell it, get rid of it, and put in something else. It just, you know, the same thing with a lot of developers or, or just property owners right. in that area, they buy land as investment mm -hmm. and they want to develop it someday. Maybe just not the right developers come along yet. So, yeah. um, you know, so it's one of those where right. we, I, I think that the job of the planning department and the planning mm -hmm. zoning commission is to um, apply the, the strategy, the, the development strategy right. for the town, which this section has, you know, for a very, very long time been, Right. An industrial or interchange district. So but also, and I understand. So that's we were not we're here to potentially in the future discussion when we get to John maybe more on that is about possibly changing some of those zones to different zoning methods. We were not tasked with you know taking every piece of property in right. the town and trying to rezone it. We were just right. tasked with trying to make uh, uses that are more watershed specific, working with water and sewer to define the uses right. uh, that would be appropriate. So. I'll wait for a, a I understand, we understand your concern 100%. So. The other question I had, the only reason I'm bringing it up because you kept mentioning the data centers mm -hmm. and the general topic, and I'm sitting here, I'm you know, not saying anything, but since it's been brought up, mm -hmm. I might as well kind of just, you know, I'm just going to talk in generalities. So data centers aren't currently in the IX zone, they're not part of the current zone, correct? No, yeah. Okay. So, well, I'll just leave it for later, I guess, is the whole general aspect, if you open the Pandora's box, to say any data center anywhere in the world, and you've explored it, or not have it. But if you do that, then you're opening a Pandora's box, not just for data centers, maybe industrial use, whatever it is. The door opens up, how are you going to close it? Why don't you open it up? How are you going to stop all these things? You know, Wallingford's right off 91, it's a great corridor for industry. Let's go to Wallingford, let's build every piece of land that they zone that's open to us and bring in our dollars, our proposals, and, you know, work with the Planning and Zoning Commission. And by the time you get done in 20 years from now, this town will look like a great industrial zone for everybody. Yeah. And the residents will have nothing left. Mm -hmm. 
you know, and that's my observation from the maps. Now, you could agree or disagree with what I'm saying, but I studied these maps on a quick learner, and uh, nothing phases me out. And what I see here, and I'm open to listening to everything, I think there's a lot of interesting dialogue going on here. But I think we have to look at the overall thing, is what I see here, there's a lot, a lot of stuff being suggested. It's only, it's only suggestions, we're a workshop. But if it becomes rules of law, so to speak, it, if, you, if I have company A and I have like billions of dollars, if only it just has all these great ideas that I can come in and there's very little room for anyone else to be protected from us because we can come in and do our proposal. I mean, that's just my opinion of what I see here so far. But I know I'll, I'll just stop here, but I want you to look at what you're doing here as a proposal. I know nothing's written in stone, but we got to think about uh, the ecosystems and a lot of things I'll get into later. This is just the point I want to, you talked about data and a few things, so it kind of eye-opened me a little bit, and I appreciate all the information there, because this is stuff I didn't really know about. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir, I know you. Thank you. I know we've been talking about water. Now, could I bring up what I've been asking? Uh, we're not, we're, we're, the water, that's the regulations are coming up a little later. Again, what we want to focus on is we're looking at the industrial expansion zone and the uses in the industrial expansion zone. We have other, as you see, regulations dealing with the watershed. So we have those regulations to come up. And I, I think that's where your question is going to be. Okay, another thing. I work at Bristol Myers. Exit 15, take a right and a left, and it's down there. Bristol Myers is no longer there, right? Yeah. Okay. There's 150 acres there. I understand. How come no one's looking over there? Looking over there for, 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 for putting stuff over there. That's that would be part of the proposed study by zone. I mean, I, I'm not quite sure what your question is as far as how no one's looking over there. I mean, obviously, there was. We have a constructor. Okay, to my knowledge, uh, whether I write saying this or not, I don't care. We have five farm owners selling their land or sold their land. There's 250 acres. We also have Bristol Myers that's empty. It's 150 acres. I'm, I'm concerned what's going to happen to all this land and what are we going to see over here. That's what I'm concerned about. And I'm concerned about the water that's going to, from driveways running off, where's it going? Are going to have retention ponds? Are we going to have oil leaking from cars and everything going in the groundwater? I got a lot of That's yeah, coming that, up in sections 4.12 and 4.13. Those three. issues are coming up when we get into those regulations. Yeah, I'll be dead by then. Okay. I doubt it. I certainly hope not. <laughs> 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 right. Let's try to keep the lanes a little clean, please. Uh, yes, this uh, uh, Mary, Mary Wyszynski, uh, I wanted to ask if you're going to reduce the amount of open space in the industrial exchange, if you would compensate by including more natural landscaping to make up for the loss of open space in that area. That will help with the overall groundwater quality and uh, runoff water quality. And uh, I wanted to ask, because I can't tell from where I'm sitting, is the North Farms Reservoir in which so? That's in the IX. Okay, so so that would be a good reason to try Actually, to. It's in the 40. Oh, it's RU40? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, does any of the IX drain into the North Farm Reservoir? Yeah. I, would, I would think it yeah. does. Mm -hmm. On the wall farm. And so, and that that is a chronic uh, over fertilization problem, that reservoir, North Farm mm -hmm. Reservoir, where people go to a boat and fish and so on. And anything we can capture. Upstream of that will make it a cleaner body of water. So some of the changes that you're going to be proposing in the next part tonight to protect water quality in the uh, watershed, the new whatever its name is, watershed interchange district, uh, you, you could also apply some of those to the IX, even with the industrial parks, and get some improved water quality there. So. Um, like a no net loss of trees could be one thing you could do. You could do um, vegetative buffers uh, along any of the swales that drain those industrial properties. There's some up there that have no buffers whatsoever. I've been up there taking pictures of them, and some of them have, just have the swale, but there's nothing 
uh, to catch any runoff from the lawns of those industrial sites before it gets into the swale and eventually gets into the North Farms Reservoir. So anything we can do to keep the water filtering uh, is good. And, and I know you're trying to get away from the campus aspect of the old zone, and you're reducing the amount of space, open space, but maybe you can trade that for more natural landscaping, more buffering, uh, leaving more trees. So that's my request, as a water quality request. So we did um, the existing language or really the, the trend in like the 80s and 90s is that the open space would be just landscapes, you know, mowing of the lawn area, just expansive mm -hmm. lawns. But we've reworked the open space definition to include a, a natural vegetative yeah. state. So it would allow you to not clear all these trees and all these buffers mm -hmm. if you don't need to. And I think developers are really gonna uh, take to that well because it would be less money for them to spend. So I'm sure there'll be some aspect of a, you know, landscaping in the front yard and everything, but it wouldn't be required to have acres and acres of uh, mowed lawn. And, the, and we also reduced minimum parking requirements. So technically you're reducing open space, but you're also reducing parking lot sizes. So kind of a first Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Bob Mayo again, 14 Marine Lane. This may be a little bit out there, but I know we took out helipads um, for and because we're silent, I don't know that the FAA frankly has figured this out yet, but you know, drones are a thing that's coming. Do, is that something if we're silent on it, an application comes in, just think about how that would be handled versus some sort of a placeholder that says drone activities at some level requires special permit. I, I don't know what you know how we handle it, but I'm not sure that silence is a good thing. Well, I think that's something that we could uh, certainly could look at. I think that's both you had a question. Uh, no, actually, in re response to the landscaping, in your um, your next section in, in, in the water protection check, uh, item number four describes landscaping really well, and <coughs> that could probably be added to GIX. <laughs> Uh, as well as the WI. It's in, it's in for the WI and it's very well written. Um, I guess my only question would be with that type of landscaping, if a, an employer wanted to do a trail or a picnic uh, bench for their employees, would it affect you know, that, that, that space? I believe we've added what, passive recreation to the definition. We kind of thought of that uh, for open space, and we believe if you look at the definition, uh, it has passive recreation, so not like, you know, baseball or something like that. It's more of just hiking through it. Um, so yeah, conservation or passive recreation. But if you could move that second floor over, yeah, to both sides, absolutely. Anyone else? I believe it was. I think the young lady behind you. Yes, uh, in the no, you. Uh, in the blue. In the blue. I'm just kind of taking notes because I didn't realize that we were going to be allowed to speak. But I guess my my first question is: Is this watershed rezoning specifically because there were serious deficiencies in the regulations of this IX zone that omitted these data centers? Is this why this whole rezoning this, uh, is this, happening? This, it, this has nothing, no. I mean, data centers have, has, was not the genesis of this. You know, it, that's. No, but I'm speaking the, specifically be, to the IX zone behind North Farms and Tankwood. Is the watershed aspect of the rezoning because technically the data centers wouldn't be complicit? Yeah, com it wouldn't comply. So is this what's going on here? Wouldn't comply with what? Yeah. Wouldn't comply with the IA zone that's currently established. So uh, I think a big part of what we were tasked with is finding the existing, like the current uses mm -hmm. that are statewide, nationwide to update our zoning regulations. Because there's a lot right. of Correct, but if they updating them, are you completely changing it to adhere to them just kind of walking in and changing the, the demographic to the entire no. Neighborhood that we've been living in? No, absolutely I, not. So we did look I, I at. Think it. Sure. I, 
I just, yeah, I, I, I want to clarify, because you saw me shaking my head when you were asking that question. We, the commission, and, and staff, and prior town staff, have been discussing IX and I-5 regs for years. For years. For years. For years. <laughs> the, the, the data center is nothing to do with this. This has been, this continues to be workshopped, you know, and I think the idea of we were close at the end of the year, and then we got comments from our own water and sewer that said, and, and through the mayor's office, hold the phone and you kind of regroup on this. So that that application, our, our own application, was about two years in the making. So it was, it was before data centers was discussed in town. Well, that has to be clear. The, this, the data centers, whether it be them or other industry, years ago, when the Werbisky farm was battling with the town of Wallingford, if these plans that were kind of snuck in at the last hour seem eerily similar to those mm -hmm. of years past. Oh, I, 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 well, I you know. might not know, but I, I know yeah, because I've lived in town yeah. for many years. <laughs> So I would like to, I mean, I don't know if it's my place to clarify the whole process, but we're in workshop mode now, I know we all understand that. And then eventually we're hoping to get a product, the full regulation changes that can be presented to plans or the commission for their hopeful approval. And then once those regulations are hopefully adopted, then other data center and companies would be able to come in and submit a zoning special permit. Uh, for approval, and then you know, at that time, that'd be a public hearing, and so it's not a way to sneak anything in by any means. It's just a way to lay some framework for what the town wants to see from these developments. Because we know you don't like the God space proposal, but you have to separate data center use, what a data center is, just say on its own, from that proposal. No, I understand that, but I just hope that everybody yeah. um, who's you know, in a position to make these leadership decisions, take into consideration the residential neighborhoods, because it's very, very easy for all of you to see the pros to this when you don't have to live with the cons of it right. and the consequences of it. Well, so I'm just going to ask that if you would not, if you definitively would not put this in your own backyard, be moral enough not to put it in ours. Yeah. But I'm saying like the, the IXO right now has uses that are worse than a data center would be and closer with setbacks. So it does seem to be an appropriate use to include in our IXO. Mm -hmm. And I just, I just want to say, you know, there's, there's a reason that these data centers are never put in residential areas. By the horror stories that are well documented and legally documented in Arizona and also in Ireland. Because they're just not put in residential areas for a magnitude of reasons, many having to do with documented serious health issues. So you should really look into the neighborhood to see if people suffer from migraines, anxiety, any type of stress-related mental illness, because this is all documented in these, neighbor in these neighborhoods. There is class action lawsuits. So if you have this information available to you and you dismiss it and put residents in harm's way, Guess what's going to happen? Thank you very much. Well, I think it's very serious, and I think you need to really realize that, from my perspective, you know, I was very vocal in the town council meetings, and it's I'm fighting not just for my family, but for my neighbors as well, because it's going to completely devastate our quality of life. I hope everybody understands that we do take all these comments from commissioners and public very seriously. So we, we appreciate everybody coming out and and I just want to make one more comment. You know, you people have to understand that these are obnoxiously loud. They are on 24/7, seven, seven days a week. They don't shut off on holidays. They don't shut off when you want to go into your backyard after a long day at work and relax. It's constant. And again, it's well documented. That's exactly why we included a noise and vibration impact analysis. Okay, do you, have science, do you have science to back up that noise vibration? Is there any scientific value to what you're saying? Well, yeah, so there's an analysis that would be performed, and then the town, mm -hmm. it would be the commission's right to hire a peer reviewer, somebody who's an expert in that field, to review that and make sure. It was actually recommended by an engineer that worked with the town in the town council process. So that's where we got most of the language from. Okay, I and really that, hope you really do your right. due diligence Absolutely. and research all of this because there's going to be a lot of people negatively impacted. Thank you. Thank you. And
Yes. Jenny Gray, Senate to 16. Um, I just want to confirm that I understood you correctly, Mr. Panini. Did you just say that God's space is not going this route, or I misunderstood you? So God's space is still going to apply if data use permitted. God's space, correct. whoever customer employees will to, still apply for special permit. But they have to adhere to the town council agreement. Well, and and the special will, permit. Will they still apply for the special correct. permit? Correct, yes. In case of a contradiction yes. between the terms of special permits, because for issuing a special permit, there is a very detailed regulation in our town planning and zoning regulation, yes. paragraph 7 and so on, um, which says that planning and zoning regulations, whatever is stricter, basically. So um, how the host agreement has certain setbacks that were not established on any acoustical model or any sound mitigation. They were based on visuals. Now, we understand that for special permit, you need to go right. with the acoustical study. And at that point, the setback might be 1,000 feet in order to mitigate down to the environmental level. So what I misunderstood you, go God space or whoever is the hyperscale yes. still go through this. So, yeah, they have to comply with anything that's in that agreement. And then, you know, whatever that is more restrictive through the zoning process, that would apply to them as well. So I think they Special permit, how would the whole package? Yes. Yeah. And so the special permit process allows the commission to take the peer reviewer's findings. And if they do, you know, recommend a 1,000 foot setback, then it's the commission's right to require that. So that, that's why we have it under special permit. So the commission right. has more grounds, more, more flexibility to require certain. Yep. Um, because we're still unknown, like she mentioned, about the use. So we want to try to do it in a way, if it, if it is going to be allowed, in the best way possible, we think. Matt, is this a good time to go in the nooks of cranny and crannies of definition of the um, uh, noise study? Like what exactly yes. substantial or it's for the meeting on the 13th or this is this the time you want to discuss it? Well, I think we can discuss yeah, it's, that it's right part now. of these it's regulations. Part, it's part of the regulations. Okay. So yeah. I think I'm referring to the... Um, uh, page two, C five data centers, C five A. Yeah. Okay. Um. And so, I think my question is, who defines substantial rates of environment? So because. Um, Special permits are very well documented and everything is laid out pretty easy. And then we had a special permit application just recently on Amazon. And uh, Amazon lesson for me personally, very comforting lesson was that in terms of sound, no matter why they were shut down for different reasons, for sound, there was a very clear bar was set very clearly, even mm -hmm. though they were allowed in the zone specifically. Uh, they came first complying with the zone, they were within zone noise regulations, which is impulse noise mm -hmm. and the continuous noise. They were within those boundaries, and still based on the acoustical study, they were compelled <coughs> to add the sound wall to make sure that they comply specifically with both impulse and um, background noise, continuous noise, I'm sorry, mm -hmm. for that area. And it was very well presented. The process was very, really, now here, mm -hmm. do I understand correctly that it's the same approach, the bar set the same way, it's environmental period? Correct. Or yeah. what is substantial then for? Can we straight that? Well, the, the study would have to require a baseline environmental noise level, which uh, the sound study that uh, they did for the initial town council was uh, roughly two weeks in the field. They established a baseline decibel level at daytime and nighttime. And uh, right? the whole perimeter because we also Yeah, I don't know exactly how the engineer does it. I'm not a sound engineer, but from what I read, yes, they take you know readings on all aspects of the entire neighborhood, the entire property. So if you're talking about a 300-acre property, they'd have to you know, take noise levels throughout every boundary of that property 
And if they were to submit something that our peer reviewer does not think it's extensive enough, mm -hmm. then that would be the peer reviewer's comment. And I'm guessing mm -hmm. the commission would recommend that the sound engineer for the applicant would go ahead and beef up their study. So that's something that we'd be depending on our peer reviewer, the expert in the field, to give us the guidance on. So substantial raise does not raise. Why don't we just put does not raise? Because this is the standard that was set on as well. And I, it's well documented. Yeah, no, I, I appreciate it. I, I guess, and I hate to do this, and I see our corporate counsel in the uh, <laughs> in the back. <laughs> Because this was, this, this, this was one of the uh, this is one of the questions is substantial substantially uh, was one of the the issues questions that I I raised with, with our corporate counsel I, I don't know uh, attorney small would you perhaps like to answer that and maybe give the same time? well I think it was developed with um, the assistance of a sound expert I mean I think that the, the problem is is that in a different to say that it, it can't in increase at all, um, that may not be, I mean, an, an increase does not necessarily make it a bad thing. So we can look at whether to change the word substantially. I, I think it, the, the reason when you rely upon an expert in that scenario and they're giving you the opinion this is, you know, that is a substantial, you're relying on their expertise. And by using that word, I think it also gives the commission the leeway to make a judgment that something perhaps that someone may argue isn't, they can say, well, I'm sorry, we, we think it is. So we can look at whether or not that word can be tightened up. Um, absolutely, we'll do that. I'll, con I'll con consult with the expert. Um, but we don't want to make it so tight that the commission can't make a judgment, you know, hopefully with expert assistance that is in a given situation something that all kinds of people may think is per perfectly reasonable, but they think is substantial. So we want to make sure we have the room to, to be able to say no based upon something. But more than happy to take a look at it and I'll consult with, we can consult with the expert. And I think that. that's the room that makes us worry most because the nature of the sound, it doesn't stop for a second. In the Amazon case, I'm sure neighbors were not happy, but they knew that the beat will go away. Now, once this is on, so this is why it's so crucial from our perspective to make sure it's ambient, period. And if because I could, it becomes okay. our new ambient sound. This is it. And if I could just add that it's well documented in devastating health effects just as badly and dramatically low frequency as high. And this is why the studies really have to be thorough. And that's why we put the infrasound. A different example would be um, a data center or any type of um, manufacturing or what that, that sits right next to the highway. So if you say it can't go over the ambient, I mean, those things can make noise. And if you're sitting right next to the highway, it makes no difference to anybody around it. It doesn't mean that there wasn't a change in it but it means that it's not going to affect anyone. So that's, that's what we need to be somewhat careful of because this regulation is not being written for that particular project. It's being written for a data center anywhere within the zone. So that's, that's the kind of thing um, we're gonna be looking at. Because also, you know, as long as it's not ambient but substantial, that word, you will be facing attorney like we were facing from Amazon and they will bring it up and they will say, no, that's not what your regulation says. I'll challenge it on to you. And they will come back to you, Attorney Small, asking for clarification. Attorney uh, uh, so Small and I have had that discussion uh, about this. So. <laughs> yes. And it, the same is adversely impact. Those words, I understand that everybody was trying to put the best effort into saying something vague. But there is a drawback to vagueness. And of course, we tend to interpret it to our disadvantage. Um, also, the other question is generators. Are generators going to fall into this uh, environmental noise? Correct. I thought that was yes. harder to achieve, but that's what's going to be required. Yes. Everything that gets you know, from the data center proposal would fall under these requirements. Every aspect of it. Okay, that sounds very good. Uh, another mm -hmm. question. Um, for compliance, 
I know that there was one uh, hearing, there was a very interesting idea with the traffic to wait till they comply, certain changes in the traffic patterns or markings are mm -hmm. implemented before yeah. issuing certificates of occupants. So here, the wording might say they need, the design should be beautiful. Who is going to double check that design and the actual results? Who is going to switch the thing off, test it, make sure it works, it complies, and then probably make uh, certificates of occupants conditional on that as an idea? Enforcement. We're worried about enforcement. enforcement. Well, they would have to, before the building department would sign off, we'd have to go over all of the conditions of these approvals and make sure that those were met before they get that building permit. So as part of the zoning process, you can put that condition in that they can't get a uh, certificate of occupancy before everything is met. Just a question. Sorry. I, just, I got a just a build time, I'm sorry. Um, is there, can we put something in the verbiage or the wording that says that there's a, if this does happen, which looks like it may, something that in six months, they do these six month tests on this verbiage to make sure they comply mm -hmm. every six months throughout the calendar years mm -hmm. so that we don't have to worry that over uh, two years from now, the muffler has a hole in it and the ambient sound gets louder or mm -hmm. the trees are dying from the visible view. They're not replacing the trees. You can start seeing things that are not complying to this regulation. So something like quarterly testing? Something, something along the quarterly line that they, they, that they go through this agenda again and they check off this list to make sure that they're complying every <laughs> quarter throughout the years they're, they're doing business. Oh, that's a good suggestion. <clears throat> hey, guys. I'll take this gentleman over here. Yes, 26 Tankwood Road. Uh, I just had a question about the back, the baseline noise study. When would that be conducted? During the permitting phase. All right, so the a company, um, the data center, for instance, would the have to would apply, hire, yeah. and then they're responsible for conducting the study? Um, okay, to so your satisfaction, I assume. I mean, well, to the commission's satisfaction, and, and they do have graphs to hire a peer reviewer. So if they, you know, if they conduct the study and the commission does not like what they see, they get a peer review, and the peer reviewer, you know, spots tons of deficiencies in that. They have to go back, redo the study, resubmit it, and then have it peer reviewed again. So it's the same process as traffic would be. So as with Amazon, they they submitted a traffic study, the peer reviewer found the most of the deficiencies that came back. So we can go back and forth, you know, four or five times maybe, uh, if necessary. Before uh, I can't, I can't speak to, you know, what it would do, but um, yeah, that's would be that would be the process. Because I'm very small. I, I, think I, I think it's very small. You know, I know we're, we're talking about the general regulation, but in, in the case of the if the gods and the God space um, agreement, they actually have to show all that and prove that to our expert during the design. So there's really going to be the multiple checks as the process goes through. So as they're designing what they're going to put there, they have to prove to the town's expert that it will be um, in compliance with any sound requirements. Anyone else? Uh, I'll get you, sir, but you've already spoken. I'll, I'll come back to you, sir. Uh, Tony Hayes, Kenny, so you know what sure. Road? I think one of the, the problems that we're going to run into is without having a specific um, uh, a sound ordinance in terms mm -hmm. of both frequency and decibel level. We can talk about decibel, decibel level all day, and they can get uh, they can get those chillers, you know, with with uh, blocks up and and get them underneath uh, whatever decibel level you guys decide is uh, appropriate. But unless you deal with the frequency of that sound, uh, which is where the health benefits are, the health. Uh, mm -hmm. The health problems come from the low intensity sound. You know, this other lady mentioned uh, there are all sorts of health problems generated by low intensity sound. Uh, the military uses it as a weapon, uh, mm -hmm. not just us, but uh, the Havana syndrome is is being investigated uh, from that with a perception that that has something to do with it. 
I actually thought of that, so that's why I included uh, well, like, Yeah, but infrasound, yeah, infrasound is not going to be the same thing. You're talking more about a resonance rather than a frequency. Right. Yep. Um, if we talk about frequency, then you can, there are just documented studies from the World Health, Health uh, Organization. There, there was a study done in Paris. There was a study done in Sweden. Um, all related to the frequency of sound and what that does to the human body. So uh, where it would have uh, effect on cardiovascular disease, um, stress, uh, it, it brings up all sorts of issues for people who are uh, living close to these facilities, which is typically why um, data centers are not permitted in the residential areas. I know that you said you, you looked at some of the data centers throughout the country, but the, the if I, and I urge you guys to do this as well, Google is your friend on this one. Um, the city of Chicago is running into issues that we're, we're facing litigation to close data centers. The city of Paris closed the data center because after it was built, um, they found that the noise that was coming from it in an urban setting uh, were too high and were creating environmental issues for the people living close to it. Um, in Ireland, where I come from, the Supreme Court uh, stopped Apple's development of a, of, um, a data center in the country uh, for two reasons. One was the environmental impact, and the second was to draw on the electric supply from, uh, there's a huge draw on electricity. We're talking about, uh, you know, in the gas space lands, they can draw as much power as two thirds of what the town is currently pro producing. Um, so there, there are all sorts of concerns here. And I think if you, if you, and nobody wants to say, no, let's not do this. I mean, we're all for, uh, everybody is looking for economic development and, and something that's good for the town but you're trying to do it in a way that doesn't kill your neighbors um, uh, or, or harm them or, or you know, bring up property values to nothing. I mean, there's, the, there are people on my street, uh, I live in the front as I said, that, that are just terrified about this thing. You know, that you're, you're looking at uh, multi-generational families, you're looking at uh, um, somebody like me, I've been in the, in the town a long time, I've lived in this particular street for 18 years. And it's, it's just a wonderful neighborhood. And I, I think when you, when you, uh, you go to, to change it, um, you just tread cautiously and, and do it right so that you're not, you're not destroying something that's, that's you know, truly pleasant. Thank you, sir. Gentlemen back here. Yes, thank you. Um, I've got more things to say from listening. But, and uh, I will say them. Uh, number one, you know, no matter what we do, the word data does not exist in the current zoning regulations, and everybody needs to know that. It's not in our current status for regulations. So here's a simple idea, and you can just throw it out the window or not. Let's take the word data as a proposed idea and put it in the garbage, and then we don't have to talk about the, the frequencies, the people's health. This is only a workshop with the word data that's not in current planning and zoning regulations. I'm proposing that you guys take it out of your idea and throw it in the garbage. We don't need any data centers in the Cruz. And let's look at the environmental impact, um, uh, you know, that was talked about just briefly about, uh, and we don't talk about that. You know, when you build things where there's open space or forest land or orchards or whatever, you, you know, animals can't speak up. They can't speak up. Birds can't say you're disrupting my nest. You know, we can do whatever we want, and we don't care about the outcome at the end of it. So, do you, you know, I mean, I mean, it only takes a trip somewhere. You go to Maine, you go somewhere to get away to where it's nice and quiet. Well, Wallingford, as a town, has about 136 farms, and that's from the assessor's office. I got that a few years ago. So I'm pretty much on target what's going on in our town. We have open spaces, we have beautiful areas in our town, and where residential people live, they do have a right to have that quietness and interviews. And what this gentleman said from Ireland, I never knew about. So these things that we learn, and hopefully we're all learning together, EDC and planning and zoning, we're all, we all have families here, we all live in town, we all have friends. You know, I believe in economic development. I was very supportive when Sonic came in because it was already on Route 5, where there was a place that was already economically burned down, and they built a new business. That's fine, if you go through town, we have to look at the environmental impact, the ecosystem, and that has to be incorporated into everything we're planning and zoning in a, this workshop. Economic, I mean, ec eco environmental standards have to be a big part, and we have to be strict and not say, well, you know, 
we can move these regulations around a little bit to make more economic development come into the IX zone. Well, I, tra I travel through North Farms Road I'm, you know, when I'm going to my radio show. So I see the Winsky Farm. I see all the beauty around it and the people that have their homes. And I see the abutting Tankwood area where these people live, and I say they're going to be devastated if this actually becomes a reality. So I think you all have to really seriously look at what this is about and also think about the, uh, the environmental impact that it has, not just on residents, but on wildlife that can't sit in a meeting and speak for themselves. What do you think about wildlife? It's not just about the data thing. I think we should throw that out and I'm being repetitive, but I know it's not in the zoning and planning. So why is it so important that we even bring up data as part of our proposal to be put into the planning and zoning? Why do we have to even count out to that and just sow that out and deal with all these other issues we have? You know, we have enough, of, uh, plenty of environmental issues and we're not talking about that. We're talking about how we can make this nice for data centers, for industrial use, for hotels, for motels. We're not talking about the sanctity of life in our community. And why not? Why aren't we talking about this here? You see what I mean? Sure. I, sir, I think you made your point. Thank you. I hate to ask you, but are we on watershed? Uh, or no, on watershed? I got another question. Okay, good. Name and address, sir. Ronald Maturo, 1009 North Farms Road. My question is, since I was electrician and I worked in Millstone 1, 2, and 3 in Connecticut Yankee, where are they going to get the power from? Is this the data centers? Yeah. Uh, all of them. Uh, all, anything that's going to be built over there, I want to know where the power is coming from. So typically it's my understanding that data centers, uh, if they're hyperscale, uh, they'll build their own substation and that's all dealt with separately. We do have regulations what, here. For substation, they're going to build their own power plant? An electrical substation. Okay. Does that mean that they're going to build a power plant? Where are they going to get the power initially? That's well, what so I... every every developer, I think, has their own way that they could go about it, but we well, can include yeah. language for electrical substations if that's needed. Am I asking the wrong question? My so question. is that going to be everything no. is electrician? <laughs> well, it's a very I think specific that. question. This is regulations in general. Is that, could that present other health issues for the residents in the area? If we have all of this in well, he's on talking first. of electric? But if they're going to step it up, where is the power initially? All I want to know is, I know we have high tension wires already through there. And they're going to they're, they're, they're northeast. Now they're going to pick off that. Yes. Correct. Well, that's what I wanted to know. Yes. Well, that's what we I mean, well, you didn't say that. I got to tell you, and that's what I found out. They're going to pick, and they're changing all the poles. Do you know that? Okay. Okay. The power lines going through Wallingford, and they're all by us. Okay, where we live. Okay, I understand. I talked to a guy today. They are changing those poles. They're supposed to be putting them on steel poles. Is that true? Yeah. I have no idea. Oh, geez. oh, geez. You guys don't know nothing. I know more than you do. So, so anything that, I will say anything that Steel Gear Eversource does with the transmission lines, that goes through the Connecticut Siding Council, and that is not subject to planning and zoning approval. So. Um, there would be really no reason for the It's 120 or 150 kVA going through there per wire, and that's three. You know, you laugh, but this is going to impact our vehicle. Yeah, that's right. This is electrical waves that's per right. frequency on top of the low level and high level ambient sound. This is not a joke. And wait a minute, I got a better one for you. I got, wait a minute, I got a better one. I don't want that to serve just for a moment. Okay, go ahead. No one thinks this is a joke. Believe me. I think the members of the commission, as well as the town staff, takes this very seriously. So when you say we think it's a joke, I certainly well, disagree with you. You know, well, when we're talking right. about you know the power and all of that, I think it, it was you know indicated that as far as putting in those lines, correct me if I'm wrong, that's not that's not the town is not doing that if those lines are going they to have be. To, they have to, they have to, got space, so she's referring to that. It has to go through the one for electric division. I don't know the details of that proposal, but you can call the electric division and they can tell you what the details are. And that, and all these questions can't be asked during an eventual right. exactly. when it comes to that. Yes. 
But I think we as residents just want all of you on board from everybody. Like when we ask a question or he brings up a point that could potentially impact our health in another area, we want you to be aware of that because this is our lives. And we got input from electric division and the only thing they mentioned were the substations and the screening requirements. So that's the only comments that we had on the uh, regulations. Yes. Uh, Mary Wyszynski again. I saw that you had the uh, noise in there, which is good. The, there is air pollution from the diesel backup generators, and I tried to include that in legislation on data centers at the end of the legislative session. And that section failed because the, the um, advocates for the data centers didn't like the language. They uh, felt that at startup of the diesel, they might be over the limit that I had written in the, in the proposed um, air pollution controls. So rather than uh, saying, well, why don't you just adjust the language, they just killed it, mm -hmm. and, it and it's dead. So I have to wait till next session to bring it up again. Mm -hmm. And uh, so right now, although the diesel unit would only be run probably once a month for uh, peak shaving, it still is a diesel generator, and it makes diesel smoke. And uh, I would prefer, as a person that lives in town, I would prefer that we regulate diesel generators because there's they're smoky things and they make diesel smoke even if they only run once once a month they still make diesel smoke so um, because it's not the legislation did not pass but I think we need it is there anything we can do in this proposal to cover not only sound but also Air pollution regulations, and I can give you the language. Yeah, I guess that, that would be my question. What yeah, I can you, get it to you. you. Know, what were you proposing? And that's something that we certainly could take a look at. Yeah, it's technical language, and uh, I can give it to you. You can run it by the uh, data center folks, but I think something needs to be there, either in the state law or here in the PNZ. Something needs to be in there because you know you don't know who's the next owner of the place going to be. Are they going to be? as cooperative as the first owner, you just don't know. And it's good to have some kind of regulation in place when you're talking about a diesel generator. If you could provide that language. Yeah, I'll give it, I'll give it to Mr. Pagini. Yes, sir. Another question I have, um, at night, they're gonna, that place is gonna be well lit up all night long. It's gonna be like daylight. So what are they going to do about that? Is it going to be like daylight? I mean, how, how, how can we straighten well, that problem out? Well, there's lighting. We have there's lighting restrictions that we have in our regulations. In the in the regulations. And they're not going to uh, affect the residential where where they're behind me, and I'm not going to affect me where my yard is all lit up all night. There's restrictions as far as full cutoff. Well, we have full cutoff lighting. They have to provide a uh, on. on uh, most of the projects, they need to provide a, uh, a lighting analysis as far as how the lights are going to come off of their site and restricting lights coming off of their site. I don't know if Correct. we'd like to expand on that a little bit more. So it has to there's there's restrictions on that. You generally have to show that there's no light emitted more than uh, zero foot candles over the property line. Is that correct? Yep. Terminology? Yeah. yeah. So it cannot emit any foot candles over the property line. Yes, this lady in the back. Um, Kathy Palmer, 18 Tinkwood Road. Um, I don't know if there's any language in there that addresses the height of the buildings. I know with the Got Space project, we couldn't really get a clear answer as to the height of some of the buildings. Some of them were thought to be maybe 45 feet tall, which is pretty tall. Um, I didn't know if that was encompassed in any of this language as far as the height of the buildings. So the God's Space Agreement, I believe, Janice, is 45 feet, not more than 45 feet. Yeah. So right now it's at 30 feet, and if they do want to increase it, 
there is no maximum height uh, they have to has to so every one foot they want to increase it they have to have five feet increased in the minimum front side and rear yard setback so that's all dictated by the lot size so if they want to increase it to 45 feet that's an extra 15 feet from that so they'd have to increase the minimum front side and rear setback uh, an extra 60 feet has already been put in place for the host agreement? No, the host agreement is for the gas space project. So if that's more restrictive than this, then they have to comply. Right. But if this were more restrictive, this would go into effect, correct? Yes. Okay. So at least there's some provisions if it's a monstrosity of the building has mm -hmm. to be set for that. Correct. Um, yeah. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen. Yes, yes. So we're done with the water and sewer. Yes. Are we done with the water and sewer? Uh, uh, not water and sewer, but the watershed issue? We haven't started on the watershed. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it does, because it does supply two thirds of the water to the town. Um, I, we have some concerns about that, too. Yeah, again, that's that's the regulation that's coming up. We <coughs> haven't got to that point yet. Anyone else? Very quick. Very quick, please. What is the 400? Uh, name and address, please, again. Oh, Jenny May is 76 Tankwood. What is the 400 feet from substation to the residential is based on? Uh, we just based it on the setbacks that were uh, in the proposal, essentially. Uh, so 400 feet. We, I think we asked electric division would be an acceptable setback for a substation. They said 400 feet. That they have now in place whenever they build yeah. a substation in Wallingford. Because there there's a substation on, down on, I forget what they said, John Street or in a residential area that's within 100 feet. So we decided to quadruple that uh, for a data center just okay. to Thanks. give extra space. Okay. Well, Anyone else? Yes. One, one quick observation that we're not just talking about one substation, we're talking about three substations. I don't know, so, depending yeah. on the proposal. The regulations cover substations that may be needed in the future mm -hmm. for any proposals that come through. So um, if you're talking about a specific proposal, that will be handled with their applications. Correct. Well, specifically with Godspace, since you wanted to be pointed out that there's yeah, three God, substations. I don't know. Godspace hasn't given us a proposal to plan any zoning yet. Anyone else on this so we can move on? <coughs> Okay. Do we want to move on? Yes. <laughs> okay, so just I guess as a refresher. WI stands for Watershed Interchange District. And we'll pull up the map since it's been a little while. So that's gonna include areas that were previously IX and I-5 that fall mostly or completely within the Watershed Protection Overlay District. Mm -hmm. So the goal here was to uh, propose uses that would not have an adverse effect of downstream waters, including waters that flow to the McKenzie Reservoir. So, okay. We're, we're trying to limit uses that would require lots of impervious surface area, uh, that would require lots of chemicals to be treated in the winter. Um, and yeah, we're trying to limit parking and require uh, vegetated open space. Uh, so we can go through that. And most of the uses were taken from the existing I-5 and the existing IX, but we pulled out some of the higher intensity uses uh, to uh, limit their use in the watershed. So essentially we're just uh, allowing you know, food and beverage production, which are lighter uh, intensity uses. Uh, we're restricting the amount of uh, what's that, retail area in them. So yep. say if it was like a brewery, we're restricting the square footage of the tasting room so it wouldn't allow uh, large parking areas. Um, we're allowing light manufacturing, uh, which we described before in the definition section. Research and development, 
uh, where limited warehousing and distribution, uh, public utility facilities and buildings without storage yards, uh, offices including call centers and financial institutions, hotels, conference centers, or combination thereof containing at least 150 guest rooms. And again, we're restricting uh, the actual, I believe it's a retailer conference space uh, as part of that. Uh, governmental buildings, facilities, and uses, uh, outpatient medical treatment facilities, non residential <coughs> elder care centers, existing residential uses. So if there's an existing residential uh, use exists, they don't become non conforming. Um, child daycare centers, outpatient small animals, animal surgical facilities. Uh, that was just a recently approved text amendment uh, to the IX zone, uh, veterinary facilities, and indoor recreation facilities. And as far as the uh, uses that require a special permit, uh, helipads, again, would Mr. Fitzsimmons like to strike that? <laughs> I guess. Already <laughs> noted. Uh, so any uses uh, that generate 100 peak hours, vehicle trips or more, uh, would require special permits. And you can go down. And then the data centers, which we've all discussed. And just um, to be clear, any changes that would be made to the data center section in 4.9 will be directly applied to 4.10. There will not be any difference. Correct. So yeah, any language. And, the, and we wanted to put data centers in the watershed, as we discussed with water and sewer, because they require little to no parking. Uh, they're very clean use, um, and they'd be uh, better for you know, a watershed area. Um, and by clean use, we really mean large building area, small parking area. Building area is uh, considered clean stormwater runoff, so that can be infiltrated directly into the ground and replicate the existing hydrograph, which is, sorry, probably too technical, but that is the goal of uh, inland wetlands, and then planning zone mm -hmm. looks at that as well. There's just accessory uses. Uh, we are not allowing uh, ground mounted solar panels. And so here is the uh, parking maximums that we're proposing. Uh, the commission may, may waive up to 75% of the required parking area if the applicant demonstrates such a waiver is warranted. So say someone comes in and they want to, uh, they don't need as much parking as they're saying, they can waive up to 75% of the minimum requirements. Uh, to reduce the parking lot area in the watershed and district. Um, let's see, and then any later use of the so they have to uh, provide an area equal to the space required for such parking, uh, just in case you know they they do need it in the future. They have to reserve it, but they have to reserve it as open space. Uh, so seventy five percent of that has to be uh, vegetated and in its natural state. Uh, the maximum number of permitted surface parking spaces is 120% of the minimum parking listed. Uh, the minimum parking requirements is 611, uh, and the same applies to uh, maximum number of permitted tractor trailer parking on building spaces. Uh, and then parking in excess of those requirements, if they really want to try uh, to go above and beyond the, the maximums, they have to provide a one-to-one -one offset. So if they wanted to do, say, 50,000 additional square feet of parking and they have room for it, then they have to provide either that 50,000 square feet as porous pavement uh, or they'd have to provide it as a green roof or some sort of permeable or water quality uh, treatment uh, what are they uh, practice. There we go. <laughs> and then also, if they want to go in excess of those requirements, they could provide it in a parking garage or underground structure, uh, as you can as you can on, uh, expand on that. That's a cleaner. Uh, it goes directly into the storm sewer system, uh, so that doesn't go as runoff because they have to be connected to the actual uh, system. And then those structures have to be included in the building coverage calculations as well. And then landscaping, there's additional landscaping requirements in this district on top of the landscaping requirements in 6.14. Um, 
The required open space areas shall be larger, contiguous to both on-site and off-site existing open space areas. Open space areas shall be natural in the landscape rather than mowed, fertilized, or similarly maintained grounds. Uh, at least 75% of the required open space shall consist of undisturbed natural and native land uh, or other land areas that will be, will be returned to a natural and native state that promote pre-development stormwater infiltration and percolation. Uh, the use of fertilizers and pesticides are remaining open space is discouraged. Uh, retail operations, which are secondary to, like I mentioned before, uh, but integrated with the main use on the premises, provided that the retail operation shall not utilize more than 3,000 square feet or 10% of the gross floor area of the principal use, whichever is smaller. So that's just to cut down on uh, food and beverage production, wanting like big tasting rooms such uh, and, or conference centers or hotels, uh, making it more into a restaurant than a conference center or a hotel. Uh, and so uh, hydrogen road vehicle fuel station operations those already exist in that zone, so we just kept that language. Uh, we're allowing building mounted solar panels and satellite dishes, but not ground mounted. Um, and then, yeah, we put in electric vehicle charging station as well uh, for use on site by associated vehicles. <coughs> and then any parking spaces associated with electric vehicle uh, parking spaces shall be used to meet the minimum parking requirements. So they can't have more electric vehicle, they have to include those in the minimum parking requirements. And then the mobile food vendor is the same language that's in there currently. We only have it once for this one. There we go. <laughs> Improvements. <laughs> okay, any commission members, any comments on this? Mr. Hyde. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, in section uh, 410C 2B, Again, we've. Um, yeah, I think he's going to change that change. He's going to yeah. make it consistent. Yeah, okay. So change the condition to expansion. Yeah, keep expansion. There's three spots for expansion. And then I, I. The other thing I noticed is that we have child daycare centers as a permitted uh, use, subject to site plan approval, mm -hmm. and then in section. B, we have it as oh, a special yes. exception. I noticed, noticed that. that today. Yeah, okay. <laughs> We're going to take it out of a special exception for the permitted section. Unless you feel that it should be a special exception. No, no, no. Um, the only other question I had is uh, you know, we took, we are not permitting the The parcel sorting and retail distribution in the WI district, Correct. which makes sense to me. Yeah. Um, but then I'm looking at all these uses that are permitted subject to site plan approval, mm -hmm. and there's, there doesn't seem to be any limitation as to you know size or parking area or you know, and, and the reason why we took it, took that parcel sorting out of here is because of the, the parking, um, primarily, because we know that those yes. uses require a lot of parking. Um, so most of, so before I keep back and answer that, uh, most of the uses that we're allowing under this, uh, we've actually reduced the minimum parking requirements for most of the uses. <coughs> so they're going to require less than they do now, and then there's a maximum of 120%. Uh, on those. Okay. And just so, so we did um, run a lot of different <coughs> existing parcels. I don't know them off the top of my head, but mm -hmm. some that were generally five to ten acres, some that were you know ten mm -hmm. to twenty, some that were twenty, thirty plus. And um, you know because there's noticeable parking lots if you go into Barnes Industrial Park and mm -hmm. that are just mostly empty. So we're looking at were those required spaces? Did they go above and beyond what was required? And now they're just not needed anymore and we found that um, those were basically they provided twice as many parking spaces as we needed so this regulation will help to um, eliminate that from happening okay, okay. fair enough um, I don't think I have any other yeah no I'm all set thank you yeah. thank you Mr. Yeah. Chairman yeah Mr. Pitts thank you Mr. Chairman 
Um, on page three, subsection E three um, B, um, it talks about loading docks to be located in the inside or rear yards. Can we add it somewhere in here? And I noticed I didn't notice on the prior one where the building has to face the stream. So we don't have mm -hmm. sideway buildings, right. and then and then when they came in, like the um, the medical facility next to the courtyard, right. Marriott, we, we had a big discussion about what was the front yard, what was the side yard, gotcha. and they angled the whole building, yeah. and it was a disagreement as far as I was concerned. So right. can we be clear that the building must face the front of the road, mm -hmm. so then there's no dis 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 disagreement regarding what's a side yard, what's a rear yard? When you say face, you mean like parallel to? Do the you want to get that specific? The front door mm -hmm. doesn't face the sure. front street. You know, we have sideway buildings in town, you know. Mm -hmm. So, and then my comment on helipad stands. Helicopter <laughs> Thank you. Any other commission Thank members? You. Members of the public. We'll start soon. We'll get to you. We'll start. Yeah, we will. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. 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 My name is Debbie DeLore. I'm at 22 Tankwood. And I have to apologize because I was trying to follow you. You mm -hmm. said something about pesticides, but you were going to, the wording was, I didn't like your wording. Mm -hmm. um, it said something that we were going to strongly uh, discourage. discourage. Mm -hmm. No, you should actually have it in there as mm -hmm. no pesticides. Because you could come to my yard and mm -hmm. say, I really don't want you to use that. Well, what's that going to mean? You know, you yeah. really should have any pesticides, especially close to water. No, I agree. Thank you. Yes. Can I piggyback on that? I support this. Uh, just leave it. Oh, sorry. Name. That's okay. I'll head call for 35 Griffith Tree Road. I fully support your comment. Um, I suggest, I was going to suggest a similar one. The only exception may be being, and I, I would leave that to the experts, if there are any invasive species that we need to fight, mm -hmm. that might be a legitimate cause to use whatever. That would be a, a question for the experts, but otherwise, please just, yeah. no, not, not at all. It's our drinking water. Mm -hmm. I don't want it in there. Thank you. Yes, and this gentleman. Yeah, name and address. Ronnie Matero, 1009 North Farms Road. Now, he was reading in there something about the runoff water. Did he read it in there saying it's going to go to the reservoir, North Farms Reservoir? Did you read that in there somewhere? I thought you heard, I heard him say that. This isn't in the near North Farms Reservoir, no. I thought I, when you read something to say it was going to go there. Um, I said it in my intro that the water shed that is within like the WI that flows to the, to the Mackenzie Reservoir. Mackenzie. That was in my intro. I don't think that's written in the regulations. Well, what I do know is, <clears throat> if you go down that uh, that Sion Pink Road, that gravel road all the way down there, there is a bridge that goes over a stream. What what is that stream? Where is that going? I mean, I the Money River is the main stream, but I mean, there could be streams off of that. Do you know where that is? Yeah. Where it was? It's, it, it's, I don't know if it's part of the actual land trust or if it's... Oh, it's clean. Yeah. But if they're going to have any runoff, shouldn't they put in a, a, a retention pond to collect whatever runoff and it'll stay in that retention pond? And yes. Evaporate. Yeah, that's, we're proposing stormwater management regulations as well as part of this. And for every project, as well as anything in this district, is also requiring, requiring the, the uh, regulations of the Watershed Protection District as well as these regulations. So it's, they have to go through all three. I mean, we can. I can go through all that if you want right now. But we're well, and to just to let you know the next. So this is the WI zone, and right. then we'll be reviewing the stormwater management yep. section, and then the watershed protection overlay district right. section. Okay. Another. Thing, I want to make a comment. Okay. <coughs> I've done in the past. <clears throat> had a fluorescent tube in my hand, and I walked under, and I walked underneath the power lines at night, and it glowed. 
That's all I wanted to know. And let people know that's what happens. And if it's the glowing, I'm glowing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Anyone else? Yes, gentlemen. Uh, Bob Tomeo, 14 Green Lane. Um, one item that seems to be out now in the why it was in the it's in the IX, it's in the IX, I think it's in all the districts under special permit, mm -hmm. is uh, require a special permit when excavating or filling of land as per regulation 610. Uh, you can see it on page two of your IX. Yes. So it's in every other dis district, but it's out of the watershed. Yeah, we want to take, take excavation and filling out of the watershed completely, uh, just because of the ro erosion, runoff, sedimentation. Uh, okay, that's a good, that's a good thing. Okay, um, and then two other real quick ones. If the commission feels like that should be added back in. No, no, that's great. That's great. As as so two other real quick ones. The, um, this is more of a comment, I think, but mm -hmm. when we think about the WI, since it's entirely in the watershed, right. the parking requirements where it says you can go in excess of the max with permeable pavers and whatnot, mm -hmm. uh, that obviously, okay, I get it. I'm in that district. I can, if I can show that I can put down permanent papers, I can have more parking spots. Mm -hmm. But then I'm also, I've got the WPD overlay. Correct. Which says 120 max. Which one wins? Well, this one would allow, uh, you know, the, the parking in excess. But anything that, you know, the WPD would uh, impose, say that triple treatment train, so that would all that language would apply as well. So if they can prove that, if they have the space, which you know most of these parcels probably wouldn't have the space to expand at a one-to-one -one offset that much parking. Um, I see how it could be contradictory. Yeah. So we'll take another look to make sure that it's yeah. intentional. You know? I heard previously on Day of Senate, whichever was more restricted. In this case, but anything that is in a district applies. So anything that's an over that's an overlay and is more restricted. Uh, that would apply too, but uh, yeah, it could get kind of. We'll take another yeah, look and make sure that it's apparent. defendable. And, you know. Yeah. No, fair enough. And my last, my last question. This, I know the focus is I five, I X. Eventually, we take this. So mm -hmm. we've got things like new definitions. Um, talk about parcel sorting centers, which exist in the I forty. Like yeah. is that going to we triple that through the entire document? Your total regs, so that everything's aligned. Meaning. Um, um, you know, you've got definite, you've got references to warehouses or right. uh, manufacturing in the I-40. Mm -hmm. I would think it would make sense eventually. Maybe it's not now, but at some point, kind right. of tie everything off. Right. And yeah, the definitions no. are somewhere across your document. That's all. It's Thank understandable, you. yeah. Thank you. Anyone know. else? Yeah. Yes. Just uh, name and address. Mary Wachinski, I'm just repeating it, 188 South Cherry Street. And I'm just repeating it uh, to make sure it's on the record. But again, uh, it's a really good job you guys have done for the proposing for water protection. I would just ask for uh, no net forest cover loss. There was a, again, I don't know which zone it's in, but Northrop Road had a, um, the cancer center proposed for Northrop Road, and it was on the only piece of woodland left in that northern part of the watershed and they were going to take it out. And there were headwater streams there, and it was protected by the forest. So ideally, we keep the forest intact. If it has to come down, replicate it somewhere else in the area. Um, so there's no net loss of forest cover. Um, and then again, the 25-foot uh, buffer protection for anything that collects rainwater and is now going into the watershed. That, that, that act of leaving the vegetation in place will filter uh, most of the nutrient problems out. And uh, it just makes it easier to keep the water quality high for the town. And in this, in this district, we haven't gotten to it yet, but we're also uh, requiring a 100-foot buffer from every waterway uh, in this district as well. Well, yeah. Which and that doubles the um, inland wetlands. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Yes. Well, I go for 35 Road. Could you please go to the table? I think it's 5 1. Mm -hmm. That has the percentages of open space and um, allowed build upon area. 
and, and sorry, I can't see it from back here. Uh, read what's allowed in the um, watershed. Thank you. So ju just to make sure, so the watershed interchange area, mm -hmm. um, the only thing that changes is the minimum frontage feet, <coughs> but it still says, stays at 50% open space. Right. And only 15% about maximum building coverage. Is that yeah. okay? Just wanted to make sure. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Anyone else? Yeah. Moving on. Oh, yes, Mr. Uh, Wolf. Name and address, sir. Uh, Jim Wolf, Economic Development. Uh, seems how you have this slide up. Mm -hmm. You have the uh, on the IX, the proposed IX, mm -hmm. you increase it to, from 25 to 30. Yeah, on the maximum building space. Knowing that I brought this up 20 years ago to go from 25 to 30, um, is 30 enough? We have several buildings, uh, property owners that have come before your commission that have ex expanded beyond the 30 uh, percent, and you've, you've approved them all. And, um, you know, so I'm just wondering if, if the 30 is really enough. Well, I think that's something that we can look at, but I, I guess I'd like to see more, uh, some more examples as to why it, why it is not. Okay. Yeah. Uh, if, I mean, certainly, we're, I, I think we'd be interested in, in a dry, at least considering that, but I think it's important to see just what the examples are and to see where we are with some of the existing development and what kind of issues that you know that, that presents itself. So I, there has to be, I think there has to be a, you know, a logical reason for that rather than just because someone wants to just keep building, building, and building. And, and I agree. And, we have, and you know, if we, we have do, and even if we do look to increase it, how do we perhaps offset some of that, you know, some of that impact on what do we do as far as on the open space? How do we make the open space perhaps more uh, more viable or something? So yeah. I think it's something we can look at, but it's just not as, as easy to say, eh, okay, 30, let's go to 35. There has to be some good reasons for that. Okay, let me, you know, I'm assuming we're gonna have another workshop. Oh, I, All right, so me, that's more me, than an assumption. All right, man, so let me put something together. Sure. For that. All right. Thank you. And if you ever wanted to get Kevin and I stuff, we could start to incorporate a little bit too. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Okay. Moving on. More oh, I'm sorry. May I just Absolutely. Have a quick comment or question? So back to Mr. Wolf's point. Maximum building coverage is set at 35 at I-40. 33.5 in I-20, and significantly lower for IS at 25, as the regulation stands now. Am I reading it correctly that intention for IX zone is general development? Like, less coverage, less intense. It's not, the way I read through all of the uh, planning zone which is for everything I could find, and, and it all they actually use and I-40, I-20, and IX now. And they're very different. It looks like IX, by actual use, and by a lot of numbers of like this, is industrial light. And I just implore the commission to look at it again, at when we're putting in, we're removing industrial general, manufacturing general, rather, from watershed. And I'm asking permission to think about it, and how IX was conceived, what is actual circumstances of IX, about, about saying residents like ours, land trust, and consider, is it really a light industrial zone? Because that's what we got there versus the industrial. And consider manufacturing general, either stroking out or under special permit or something. It's just, to me, you know that, but to me, it's the same. Thank you. Okay, moving on now. 
Sure. You know, everybody wants our town to succeed, and I understand that this could generate tax dollars to benefit everybody. But at some point, you need to like just look at this big picture in its entirety and realize that neighborhoods with living, breathing human beings who are raising their children five generations deep, which is my case, you've got that in one area. Health issues, eco issues, animal displacement, wildlife displacement. We have every type of wildlife back there. Even red fox, which I believe. No, I, I, I don't mean to cut you, but I think this gentleman kind of reiterated that already. But so I'm, I'm just saying, when you've got residential areas surrounding this, and on the other side, the land trust, and this is pristine land, why are you dumping industry that is docu well documented? to negatively impact human life and animal life. Why are you dumping it in, in a, such a place that it's going to, there's going to be no benefits other than the almighty dollar? Mm -hmm. And I understand the almighty dollar is important, but is it more important than the human beings who are raising their children in this area? Is it more important than the ecosystem? Is it more important than the wildlife, the wilderness? You know, I, I, I've been I know, five I generations. I, know, I, I understand what you're saying. I think what we're talking about here is most of these, the uses that are, the use, most of these uses are already in the IX or even in the old I-5 zone. So those are there right now. What we're attempting to do is to better define what the uses are. Like when we had, uh, with that, I don't like. It. I won't go. Won't go into that application. But I think what we're, you know, what we're trying to do is to be more definitive uh, with the uses itself. But I think, as Mr. Pagini indicated initially, with the regulations right now, to a very large degree, it includes, you know, all of these uses. So it's not that we're, you know, we're but taking property. We're, we're not taking property that's that zone for simply say farmland or whatever and saying now we're going to start developing that with you know with manufacturing all of those uses the majority of these uses are already allowed in those areas so that's that's something that exists right now what we're attempting to do is to better define it and with the uh, the watershed area to look to restrict uses in the in the watershed to protect the watershed you know, uh, in, in a much more appropriate manner. So it's not like we're all of a sudden taking real estate or land and rezoning that for industrial uses. That's not what's, what's occurring here. Well, I understand and that. I, and, and again, I, and I understand what you and this other gentleman, you know, is, is indicated. And believe me, I understand that. I think all the commission members understand that. Let me ask you this. If all five um, areas landowners did not sell, did the town ever entertain the idea of rezoning it to be farmland and take the industrial zone out from behind North Farms and Tanglewood? No, we've never had to, you know, we've never had that discussion. This has been a, you know, it's been designated as I-5. I'm not sure if Mr. Wolf uh, The economic development about 25 years ago, uh, drew a plan and had a site plan made to extend the road from the uh, uh, industrial park right out to North Farms. That, and we can show you those maps that are 20, 25 years old, and we looked to develop it back then. Right, I think those are the maps I was talking about earlier that look yeah. similar to the plans now. Yeah, so, I mean, this, this has been, uh, you know, available for manufacturing for years. When was it? Uh, when was it uh, zoned manufacturing? Do you know, Mr. When did it happen? Why? Well, I, I have. I, mean, I think it's been. It's been. A, it's just been a very long time. Do the owners usually apply for such rezoning, or towns can do it unilaterally? Well, I, the town can look to rezone property, certainly. But what you know, what occurred back 25, 30 years ago when that was developed. Oh, excuse me, when that zone was changed, that's when the zone was changed. That's that's what we have today. So, yeah, <coughs> yes, in the, 
in the back. Name and address again. I'd like to go first to the Faculty Road. One more point to the watershed. And only because you explicitly kind of encourage data centers there. They run on diesel backup generators, correct? Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. So can I assume, number one, that any language with the air pollution would apply to WI as well? Correct. And number B, would you consider any special language to make sure that that diesel, I, I assume it's going to be stored on the site, that that cannot enter the water shed or, or body river or whatever? Yes. I believe that's addressed in the watershed protection. Okay, it's in 413. Okay, okay. What I'd like to do if we could yes, sir. I know you like I got a course. What are these down there saying? I noticed Wallingford has a lot of industrial, which is good. And they pay the taxes, which is good. And the residents pay less taxes because of our industry. Now, I'm going to ask this question. Would all these industry come in, is it going to lower our taxes for the residents? Or is it going to stay the same? I guess it would all depend upon how the property was developed. That's my best answer, sir. I'd like the assessor. Well, yeah, that's my best answer, sir. I mean, we should be concerned about our taxes, shouldn't we? Not for, not for tonight. No. Oh, no, okay. so that's another night? That's, that's another night. Because I have some real good questions about Thank that. you, because I want to know. I want my taxes to go down if the industry is coming in here. Let them Anyone else? Yes. Well, in referring to what you said, what I talked about earlier, regardless of whether it's repetitive or not, we are the part of this community. We yeah, sir, we understand it. Does it does it understand? Not, I, know, sir, I don't mean, I don't mean to cut you off. I know you don't. We've heard that. It, it's I want to know that. It's, it's, I want to know, know that it's on the record. It's been on the record. And I want to know that it'll be considered for what you talked about zoning changes. That's my key point. Can we change the zoning? I think we can because it was created by 25, 30 years ago by people at that time who brought in these changes. So I'm just saying I want you to seriously consider changing, and I've submitted this report to planning and zoning, so I have it on record, to change some of these IX zones where areas that are open to the farm zones or rural zones. That's all I'm asking you to consider. And that's what I want to make sure you're seriously going to consider on the record. And do I have your agreement that you'll look at that? Yes or no? We consider anything. I mean, if you, Again, I'm not. I'm not going to commit to say we're going to, you know, tomorrow start of looking not. to, you know, to rezone anything. You know, we work with the Economic Development Commission. The Economic Development Commission uh, provides input to the planning and zoning. So there's a lot of things that come into uh, into play. And I, you know, I, I would suggest that one of the things you may want to do is to talk with the Economic Development Commission also. I'm always happy to talk to them. Good. In fact, I support. Many things on Route 5 that have come here in our community. So I'm just making sure that the people here that have concerns, not just residential areas, that the, like you were saying, I think is very important, that we look at changing some of these old zoning zones where there's not buildings, where there's not uh, department stores, and protect those areas and change the zoning. And that's what I'm saying. And maybe in a future workshop, we can go into that a little more and help you well. I mean, I'm, I'm happy to protect the watershed. I think that's really important. But I think we need to talk about the whole totality of land. And I know there's development areas, there's undeveloped areas, there's mixed zoning. We need to change it, because it's old stuff. It needs to be changed to the current situation we're in right now. And basically, our economic, our, our ecosystem, and the residential people, they make some good points. I've listened to everybody, and there's a lot of good points here. Everybody has some good things to say. I'm just saying, I want us to look at making notes to say, okay, Ken, you know, we'll consider changing some of these zones that have been around for 25, 30 years, and listen to some of these people in the community that have homes near abutting properties, like that old farm is right across the street, and what's going to happen? So, again, I think you've made your point. Okay. Okay, I, I appreciate that. We have a lot to go on, no. to continue to go on here. And so I think we're being, and I don't mean to be insulting, but no, I think not. we're starting to be a little redundant. I understand. And we need to move on, so I thank you. I thank yes. you. Yes. 
woman in the back again, and please, let's... I'll, I'll try to be quick. I would um, appreciate that. I might go for 35 or 3 road. Um, to that point, I think the POCD has um, supporting farm farming use in somewhere in, in, in the POCD. It's that that is a goal. Um, and then the other question would be, what would be the procedure if these people are interested to get that zoning change? What what's the correct procedure? Would they have to bring up uh, an application to the Planning and Zoning Commission? Or anybody can put a zoning application. Okay, moving on. Sure, I can if you want. <laughs> We're going to be coming up brief for a minute. Um, so this section is stormwater management 4.12. It's a brand new section. It does not exist in today's regs. Uh, the point of this is, um, you know, the engineering department reviews the stormwater aspects of every application that goes through planning and zoning. And right now we review those based off of state requirements and, and guidances from the state of Connecticut. So this is a way to memorialize that in our zoning regulations, um, because right now, quite truthfully, we require a lot of things, we recommend a lot of things in our uh, comment letters to the commission, but if the applicant were to say, show me in your zoning regulations where that's required, I don't think we could. So it's a way to, to make sure it's included in there. So I'm absolutely gonna spare you from reading this entire thing. But the gist of it is um, attenuation of peak flow. Um, so whatever is the existing ground cover today, whatever the existing stormwater that is exiting the site today, any proposals would not be able to increase that. Um, so that is applicable, this 4.12 section, to the entire town. Not just IX, WI, not just one part of town or another, it's the entire town. And that would be construction of anything over 10,000 square feet or more of impervious surface area. Yeah, there's, there's a lot of applicability um, section, but we really tried to, to capture everything. For example, something that we excluded, just to kind of give you a flavor of it, is if um, you were to build one house on one lot, we would not be requiring a full stormwater management plan. Something else as we went through this that we realized was lacking is if a stormwater management plan was submitted with the operations and maintenance manual, which is to say all of the upkeep and maintenance that you have to do on your drainage system to keep it functioning in a way that promotes water quality. Um, that, if that was approved for a certain landowner or property owner and then the property was sold, there was no real record that the new owner has to abide by that maintenance uh, manual. So what we're proposing here is a um, filing a notification of operation maintenance manual on land records so that when you go through the title search if you're buying a you know for example an industrial property or something like that you'll see on the title search that there is a notice of plan that they must abide by so um, that's our way of kind of making sure that it gets passed on from owner to owner mm -hmm. um, can you just start scrolling through and i'll see if anything else jumps out at me go through we, we do have certain definitions they do get quite technical um they really are taken from the state of connecticut uh, resources so um, I'd be happy to go into anything that anybody wants, but, and then we do define exactly what we want to see in the stormwater management plan. Um, as much as we were looking at the state of Connecticut manuals to, to put together the section, we also looked at the town's MS4 permit, and part of that is keeping track of directly connected impervious areas, so, you know, we're asking for those calculations as well, which is above and beyond the highway drainage manual or the water quality manual. So we're looking yeah, to preserve and protect streams, channels, wetlands, water bodies, water courses, other natural features that provide water quality and quantity benefits, including upland areas. Mr. Gabe, can you yep. slow down a little bit? Oh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> you sure you want to? <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, so yeah, we're looking to you know really preserve the natural features that are on the site uh, as of right now, uh, prevent pollution of drinking water sources, both above ground and below ground, uh, by minimizing the discharge of soluble pollutants, uh, and we're hoping, you know, to prevent pollutants from entering uh, receiving waters and wetlands uh, and preserve undisturbed natural areas from development and minimize creating and clearing of land. So we just put in a lot of extra layers into these to really uh, enforce what we're trying to maintain in most of our uh, development. And I guess I do want to um, kind of reiterate the MS4 process. The entire state is going through this. And so, um, 
we had a lot of references to use from different towns. We were really very picky mm -hmm. about, I, I think I printed out yeah. at least 12 to 15 different towns regulations and picking exactly what we liked from each one and how to make it the strongest, most, you know, the, the cleanest water, everything that we could um, within reasonable guidelines. So yep. uh, that was a great benefit. So a lot of this is kind of a hodgepodge from different towns and different requirements that have already been adopted. And the operation and maintenance plan requires routine maintenance a uh, minimum of twice per year uh, to ensure that the drainage facility or system is unimpeded and operational. Um, and anything else you wanted to um, touch on? Documentation. Uh, this is plans. yeah. It's it's honestly pretty uh, pretty dry. But it's it's everything that you would expect for a stormwater maintenance plan or stormwater management plan rather. Um, for, for larger developments, they will need detention basins, they will need underground detention basins, and we outline all of that, uh, exactly what they have to go to, but it's it's stuff that's honestly been done for as I long as my predecessor was here, so you know, at least about 20 years. So uh, this is just really, honestly, a way to memorialize it and be able to point, and honestly, makes it much more development friendly as you know they're looking through the regulations, they're not guessing, I get calls at mm -hmm. least a couple times a week saying, what are you gonna require here? And you know, I have to go through this every single time. So this is a way that they can just look at the zoning regs and provide us exactly what we're asking for the first time and should help everybody on all sides of it. Um, yeah. Sorry, yeah. Is there anything you want to us to touch on more or us to uh, expand on more? Keep, keep scrolling and I'll see if there's anything else that's different or and then we'll definitely take some questions. And then, obviously, we mentioned the operation <coughs> plan. So prior to obtaining, to obtaining a zoning permit and or starting work on a project, uh, the operation and maintenance plan and notice of operation and maintenance plan shall be recorded on the land records. Um, and then we have the minimum plan requirements, what it includes. So there's no questioning as to what uh, they have to do. Um, And they have to submit uh, as built before a certificate of occupancy or zoning compliance uh, certificate. Uh, okay, yeah. Mm -hmm. Questions from the commission. Any questions from commission members? I know it's riveting stuff. It is. <laughs> Anybody from the public? I love it. <laughs> Where's our uh, water guy? Uh, no, I don't mean <laughs> I, 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 I think you want to refer to you as well. I mean, the gentleman that had all the questions. I'm sorry. I, would have raised my hand. I wouldn't refer to you as the water guy. <laughs> it would be water and sewer. <laughs> yes. I'll let go for 35 of the road. This might just be an understanding question. Is that in any way related to the MS4 program yes. of the state? Yeah, so it helps us track it. So I, I believe that this work permit doesn't quite require you to have something on your zoning regulations, but strongly encourages you. It will help us, you know, achieve what we're trying to achieve with the MS4 permit. Um, the part that's going to help us directly is the reduction of directly connected impervious area. So we're asking the applicant to give us that number instead of us having to figure it out ourselves. And that's something that we do have to track going forward. The new permit, I think, is up next year. So we'll see what those requirements bring, but it will kind of bring us up to speed for that. As, as a follow-up, if I may, I was looking at the um, CTD, I think, website, and I noticed that, at least from what I could find, um, there was no data on exactly that portion of the Muddy River. Um, I think they, they have either appropriate for aquatic use or uh, aquatic life, recreational use, I think, or aquatic life. And for the muddy river section, there was no data available. So I'm just curious, um, this is our drinking water again, why don't we have data? I think that's CTD that collects the data. Um, it wouldn't be the town that collects the data. Right, Neil, do you have any direct relation to CTD? I think it was told, I might be wrong, either you or Mr. Beltramides, Submits the data to the CDD? Mm -hmm. I certainly do not. I, I don't know that works. public works would either. 
Maybe it was a miscommunication, but maybe if you send me the link, I can take a look at it tomorrow. Okay. Sure. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? I think we said anyone. Hmm. Kevin's rested now, so we'll take we, uh, <laughs> How much longer do you want to go for it? Well, I think we want to go into now the... Uh, okay. I mean, I we're kind of, yeah. I, I think we're, we're there. Coming, we're, yeah, we're, we're coming. coming. So I think we want to go into every single now. Keep it going. Yeah. Trains rolling. Keep it going. The baseball game's almost over. Don't worry about it. <laughs> it's three to nothing. There's a... <laughs> I'm good to go. <laughs> Oh, a lot of good ones. <laughs> uh, so this is the Watershed Protection Overlay District. Um, some of the existing language is the same, a lot of it is different. Uh, so this is an overlay district which provides for additional condition standards and safeguards to the permitted uses of the underlying district uh, in order to maintain the surface water of the long-term area in South Central Connecticut. And that's, so there's many different Watershed Protection Overlay Districts. So everybody's clear, it's all of this. And it's a lot of over here as well. And so a lot of, just to kind of clarify, I know there was a little confusion about this. In December of 2020, the last regulations that were before the commission, um, they included information that really belonged in the general stormwater management section. So we moved a lot of that with coordination with the water division to the stormwater management section. And then this is more of just the above and beyond measures that wouldn't be appropriate for every section, or every zone, I should say, within the town. This is specific for the watershed protection overlay districts. Uh, so the, essentially the treatment train that was in the existing language is uh, roughly the same. Um, I believe the water and sewer division just sort of tweaked their uh, requirements in that section. I can't speak to, you know, their technical language, but. <laughs> yeah, essentially it's the same. They have a very specific treatment train. They want to see a diversion structure mm -hmm. that diverts up to a 25 year storm to an oil water grit separator and to a filtration basin, which is typically a sand filter. So um, that's remaining the same as outlined here because it's really only appropriate in the watershed production district. Yep, and we added just some language. So prior to the commission acting on the application, uh, a review of projects located within this overlay district shall be completed by the Water for Water Division and comments and recommendations submitted to the commission. Uh, so the Water Division has to uh, do a thorough review of any project uh, before the commission can act on the application. That's all that means. And this is the uh, buffer I mentioned before. A minimum 100 foot buffer must be maintained between any surface waters, wetlands, and the developed land area located uh, in the Watershed Protection District. Um, this buffer shall be measured from the edge of the surface water or, or from the edge of its directly adjacent wetland, uh, whichever provides a greater area of non disturbance. And applicants are encouraged to exceed the minimum drainage standards set forth in the stormwater management requirements so that's section 4.12 uh, to increase the positive impacts in flood plump, flood prone and public drinking water supply areas and proposed stormwater management plans i have to conform to the technical guidance and procedures uh, of the department of public health general construction best management practices for sites within a public drinking water supply area and uh, as far as the operation and maintenance plans within the water protection district, uh, property owners within this dist overlay district shall allow the commission and agents and the town of Long for reasonable access to the site for inspection purposes uh, to ensure the owner properly maintains and operates the stormwater management and treatment system. Um, and they would take periodically take samples and determine what repairs, maintenance, and replacement of the treatment system components are necessary. And then landscaping, we added this section. Uh, this was more of a stormwater management friendly landscaping. Uh, it requires curbless islands. Um, anything 75% uh, of the minimum required open space, uh, same as with the WI, uh, undisturbed natural native land. And then landscaping within parking lots, we expanded to include uh, more stormwater management friendly uh, 
requirements. Yep. Yep. Um, so basically, just yeah, depressed islands without curving. Um, just more, more green spaces within parking lots, essentially. And so lot treatment also, uh, no parking lot containing more than 10 spaces shall be treated with sodium chloride for ice control into parking spaces, drive aisles, and driveways. And then also the maximum number of permitted parking spaces uh, shall be 120% of the parking requirements within this district. Um, and stormwater management systems in parking lots shall be designed in accordance with the Connecticut Stormwater Manual. And the general construction best management practices for sites within the public drinking water supply. So that's a new language. Uh, we added that document in there as well. And the 120%. So that, that is a repeat to the WI zone, but because we wanted it to be applicable to the whole WP. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so th these are just extra general standards just to increase water quality and quantity measures. I don't know if you want to expand on those. But. Not particularly. <laughs> and then uh, sidewalk treatment as well. Sodium chloride should not be applied to sidewalks or other impervious walkways uh, in the overlay. And then storage containers, the language uh, didn't change much. We just updated some of the, uh, the years as far as the uh, documents are concerned. Um, yeah, this is pretty much exactly as um, recommended by the Water Division back in 2020. And then we did add, this is new language as well, so any special permit use in the watershed, uh, this is just new language, is saying that the commission will consider uh, potential impacts to the watershed based on the specifics of the proposal, including but not limited to the amount of impervious area, the minimization of parking and loading spaces as practical, uh, cohesiveness of open space area, maintenance of open space area in its natural state, as opposed to lawn development, uh, the proposed stormwater treatment system, and the proposed parking area sidewalk treatment for the winter. Uh, and this, it allows the commission to include conditions of approval that it deems necessary in order to best protect the watershed uh, in addition to the requirements of this section. Yeah. Yeah, that's it. I guess I, I just, one question just on B1B as far as the treatment. You know, that initially I think in prior uh, regulation was a half inch to you know, an inch. Now it's just an inch. The reason for that change? Yeah, that was, uh, so one inch is a general measurement for first flush. Um, and so the water division wanted it to specifically relate to one inch, <coughs> the first inch of rainfall over the impervious area. So, um, you know, studies have shown that that first inch has the floatables, has the sand, has the oils, and that's what we really want to target for treatment. Because anything after that first flush, it's now basically running over a clean, um, you know, parking lot, and you can kind of discharge accordingly. Thank you. Did you have a question? Yeah, my questions were on uh, page five. Um, on page five, it's number four. Um, It's the very last sentence of number four. It says more elaborate electronic systems. More elaborate electronic systems will be acceptable. My my suggestion is that we be specific. And I know technology changes so much, but mm -hmm. the idea that we, we want them to do monitoring is great, but mm -hmm. that is just too vague. Right. Um, and then I you know, it, because it talks about a, a simple, flexible dipstick is capable. But there's been so many changes in that space. Right. And then my last comments are the very last paragraph. Um, and, and Kevin, you had a reference to it, section um, G yes. of special permit uses. Yes. Um, this should be cleaned up to mm -hmm. say something to the effect of, like the gentleman in the back of the room, the commission relies on water and sewer to give us suggested conditions. Right. Because here I'm reading it says the commission 
should I consider? But we're doing it because we make all applications, we solicit department comments. Right. So either it says in conjunction with planning and zoning, mm -hmm. the water department might be, because a lot of, if I'm not, if I'm correct, Mr. Chairman, a lot of applicants work directly with water and sewer yep. before they show up at town hall and say we're ready, to, we're, we're ready to present our thing. So a lot of work happens with staff. Mm -hmm. This doesn't best reflect the fact that we rely on the water and sewer division to, yeah. to do that. So, so I, I'm just suggesting I think it's great, but I think it needs to be expanded mm -hmm. and be clear it's not just the commission they require this because right. We'll, you know. we'll take a look and follow up with you if, if we can't achieve that. We've yeah. had a lot of conversations about how the zoning regulations can't necessarily give the water division powers. I and so we could, yeah. uh, but we'll, we'll try to refine it and get back with you if you know, we right. run to a roadblock. But. And, then, yeah. and then the other question, I know, I know it's late. Um, mm -hmm. It only says special permit uses. And procedurally, we solicit water and sewer comments yeah. on everything. Right. We can require a special permit, but we would, can we request it on permitted uses? You know, like, right. and I, you know, I know water and sewer has been sitting back in the room all night, but I don't know if they have any other comments in relation to that because I don't know if we should save it with the big guns for special permits because we get comments from water and sewer. The water, the water supply for this town is very important. This is nice to memorialize it. I'm yeah. sorry, this is the closer. Yeah. It's nice to memorialize it here, but mm -hmm. I just think. It's more than just a special permit. I, I thought we included that as well. Out, 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 out is B of one C. B one C. Sunk my battleship. <laughs> oh, there. Okay. The, the point of the last paragraph is really when there is a special use. And I appreciate the comment for us from the water division to provide guidance, but it was really just a call out as well. If it's a special use and above and beyond, let's mm -hmm. measure twice and cut once. Yeah. That's that was the intent of that paragraph. As I said, I like it. I just think it needs to be expanded further because you know, I've never met Eric Kruger, but he's pretty important. <laughs> 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 I have no idea what he looks like, but man, he, he, you're right. he's got a lot of power. That's right. We see the signature. No, I'm, 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 I'm afraid of him. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any other commission members? Members of the public. Yes. I'm like Cole Ford, 35 Fourth Street Road. Um, one of, for my understanding, any existing use will be grandfathered in. So, yeah. any current existing yeah. use will be grandfathered in. Yeah. Like, so this is, the watershed protection district doesn't really. Uh, yeah, it doesn't really describe uses. It's more the underlying zone that would define right. uses. Right. I just I just noticed today that for example the bus depot is in that zone, which is basically ninety percent impervious surface. Yeah, it would take out that use. It would be non-conforming, you know, as as it would go. To, you know, yeah. and, and I mean it's yeah. yeah. So I, I think the process is it couldn't be expanded upon without Correct. a variance. Is that yeah. true? Correct. And I, I might have missed that because I didn't read through the entire thing. Um, monitoring and, and enforcement is taken care of? Yes. Okay. I believe that's in the operation maintenance plan uh, as well as this. Mm -hmm. It requires really for two, what, two visits a year? Yeah. And, and is that falling all on the board of vision? Or just the applicant or former? Yeah, they have their own to inspect properties too, but if they need assistance, then they'll use them. Yeah, because I think it's all, it's also a manpower and a financial burden. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Anyone else? Yes. Just um, Mary Mishinsky, 180 South Cherry Street. I just want to ask if there is 
a requirement that travels with the uh, records, land records, to maintain the subsurface and the basin systems. I, I have seen when I've gone to other sites in other towns where the system was put in and then it was not maintained, it filled up with the material and, and the owner never cleaned it out again. So that it failed to work. So not currently, but the storm in section 4.12 does require filing all land records. Okay, was the maintenance part of all track with the Yes, it's an operations and maintenance manual. Okay. So for instance, if the uh, system requires cleaning out the catch basins twice a year, mm -hmm. then there'll be a notice of uh, operation maintenance manual that would then require them to go look at that and abide by that. Okay, that's good. Yeah. That, that occurs in the space of some of the other Definitely. We've so seen it too that often. Thank you. Mr. Hunt. Thank you. Uh, th this is something that was actually just brought up um, by uh, Jim here. Um, <laughs> 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 so, so no, but, but my question is this, um, what's, if somebody violates or fails to maintain, um, you know, one of these maintenance plans, um, or abide by the maintenance plan, what's the enforcement mechanism? It would just be a zoning violation, yeah, I don't, I don't know if there's any real uh, finding powers written in there at all, but that's a good, that's a good point to bring up. Um, it's not my point. It's uh, <laughs> no, the, guy the, guy here. Here. <laughs> the guy next to us. Very good point to bring up because that's right yeah, now. I mean, you need a normal cease and desist, and, right. and if it's something that needs to, I mean, if we have to go to court, we go to court on it. It yeah. may, some of that may overlay into the MS4 area, I would think, and then we have obligations to take affirmative action under that yeah. also. So, yeah. you know, is it a perfect system? Absolutely not. It's not. Yeah, and, and that's what I was, and is there a, would there be a private cause of action as well to an abutting landowner, or is it just primarily a town enforcement I would action? say that if it were to be abutting, it would have to cause damage. There'd have to be some harm. You know, I don't know, I mean, maybe an abutter has a private nuisance case. I, you know, it would really probably depend on the facts of the case. Yeah, no, I, I, fair enough. I just, I just want to make sure that there's some sort of enforcement mechanism. That's okay. Thank you, Sue. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay, uh, moving on. So I think the next was the, um, the table, which has been discussed quite a bit, but happy to take another look. There we are. Yeah. Anyone, any questions on the table? I think that we've probably discussed all of that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, moving on to our last and final, I believe. What's that story? Um, oh, no, excuse me, parking. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we think you kind of alluded to it before, so I'm going to come again, or? Uh, so, as far as uh, Public Act 2129 has passed, uh, the commission can opt out of the requirements. Uh, I believe it's before January 2023, but then they require all single family dwelling units to have one space, two family dwelling units to have two spaces, three family to have two spaces. Uh, so this is just something that the commission can opt out uh, if, they, if they desire by two, three vote. So we can discuss that at a later time. <laughs> hotels, motels, uh, we got rid of the gross floor area of restaurant and banquet area, one space for each 50 square feet of gross floor area, nightclub or lounge area, and we just changed it to customer seating, standing, and dancing area. Um, we didn't think that was applicable anymore. Uh, manufacturing, we changed it from one space for each 500 to one space for each 1,000 square feet. I, I think we should add that a lot of this is driven from the parking gym. Parking gym, so correct. Yeah, we didn't yes. take it up. But it is seeming to go in the direction of less parking required, which is encouraging for our WI zone, where we're yep. capping at 120% of the minimum required. 
And yeah, we're changing <coughs> one space for each employee to one space for each 3,500 square feet of gross floor area per the uh, parking manual. And research and development uh, parking manuals recommended one space for each 1,000 square feet instead of 400 square feet of gross floor area. Uh, and parcel sorting and retail distribution. Uh, we sort of looked at numbers uh, from around the country for these types of uses. Uh, we decided one parking space for each 1,500 square feet of gross floor area and one and a half parking spaces for each retail delivery vehicle stored on site. Uh, would be an appropriate number uh, just from some data that we compiled because there was no there was no uh, you know use in the parking manual for that or yeah no use in the parking manual as of yet uh, data centers we had one parking space for each employee at peak shift uh, that was a general parking requirement uh, through bunch of number of different uh, zoning. Yeah, and there seems to not be a direct correlation between the amount of employees and the size of the building, so we thought it was less appropriate to make it a square footage of the building um, and more appropriate just number of employees. Uh, indoor recreation facility, we looked at parking manual, we looked at uses in the area, and we came up with uh, one parking space for each 700 square feet of gross floor area uh, would be an appropriate number for that type of use. Um, and other uses not listed above well, that stays the same. Yeah, yeah no, my comment is just with the first one, uh, you know, single family dwelling units and that. And, and as far as, you know, with Public Act 2129, that's effective currently. So if someone came in, you no. fall under that. Or when does that become effective? I, I believe you have until, I could be wrong, January 2023. Okay, so we have plenty of time on that. Cause Again, when I'm looking at this single family dwelling, you know, one space, I think most of us realize that yeah. there's probably more likely, to, not that I'm saying we should increase it to three spaces, but mm -hmm. I suspect that, you know, it's, it's, I'm just looking at these, so I think that's something at a, mm -hmm. certainly at a, at a later date we want to look at. Certainly yeah, I mean, the, we don't have to include these. Yeah, no, I you no, know, no. so we no, could I take them out for now and read yeah, later. That, that would, yeah, that would be, be more. Fair. And some of the other, you know, the other reductions, don't have an issue with, but it was just this one right here. I think that so we should take it out for now. The changes. I would right? suggest that some other commission members probably feel the same way. Okay. Yeah, if you really should do that. Yeah, you should do that along with us to make a decision. Yeah. Right. Okay. Anyone? Any commission members? Members of the public? Any comments? Yes. I just want to say that twenty-five twenty-six. Years, I've been coming to these meetings. This has been the best presentation. You guys did a lot of work in a relatively short period of time. And I want to commend you on it. I mean, as it was said before, we've had these meetings. I think you said the electric company was 212, is where you took the verbiage from? Mm -hmm. 2012? Yeah. Okay. We had four, five uh, IX and I5 workshops prior to that. Uh, probably 28, 25, whatever. So, you know, people think this was overnight. Uh, things don't move that way. You, know, mm -hmm. you guys covered a lot of ground. Whether or not I agree with it at all, we'll talk later. Right. But I think you did a great job. Thank you. Thank Appreciate you. it. After all those comments, name and address. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm sorry. John, John Gary, Economic Development Commission. Thank you. Any other comments uh, from commission members, from the public? Again, I would just like to uh, you know, certainly thank uh, our engineering department, our planning department, uh, for all the work they put into it. Certainly, this is this is uh, not uh, not the end. We certainly intend to have um, you know one, perhaps two more workshops on this. So we certainly appreciate the uh, you know the public coming out and voicing their comments. I, I will you know just want to make clear that. Uh, you know, the commission doesn't have deaf ears. We certainly appreciate the comments that are made by the uh, made by the public. Uh, we're looking to have consider those comments and uh, as, as we look to uh, revise or uh, we'll say improve the regulations but make changes to this. So uh, we certainly appreciate the comments. Uh, I'm sure that some people may feel that we don't uh, 
Oh, I'll stop it. So I certainly, <laughs> I certainly appreciate the, uh, the public coming out and uh, appreciate all the commission members uh, being here. Uh, and Mr. Amwick, I know uh, we uh, certainly appreciate you coming here. Uh, I hope we didn't tie up too much of your time. But I, I, I think. And, uh, thank you for being here. And, and Attorney Small, uh, again, thank you. Yes. So with that, I'd entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Got a second? All in favor? Aye. 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 Aye.